So without further ado, I give you Mark. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I just want to get uh, like take a little stock here first. How many how many screenwriters do we have here? Or television writers? Screen? Wow. Okay. So a lot of writers. A lot of writers. And. Um, yeah, just uh, yeah, just right. You call yourself a writer? That's cool with me. Um, what about producers? Who producers? Yeah, yeah, producers. No, okay, a couple. What about directors? Any directors in here? Okay, so a few hyphenates, huh? Anything else? Any other actor? Actor? A editors? No. Any? No. Okay, so mostly above the line. Okay. Um, and it, it, are any of you guys members of any guilds or unions or professional like SAG? D okay, DGA, WGA? No, not yet. Not yet. Um, and who, who's working in the industry right now? You guys are, okay, so a few of you. Like, even if you're not doing the thing you want to do, but you're working in the industry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how many of you guys, I'm just trying to get, kind of get to know who you guys are, but, um, uh, so I can kind of tailor this a little bit, but um, how many of you guys are, um, have any pro professionally produced credits? Like, not student films or, like, you know, short films, but, like, something that was, you know, distributed, you know, feature film that was distributed, or television. Yeah, film, yeah. Okay, yeah, so a few of you, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so like you guys have been doing it, so if you, yeah, you guys have been doing it, that's okay, that's good. Um, do you guys, anybody have an idea of why we're here, what we're going to talk about? Because, okay. <laughs> well, okay, so good, yes. Some of that, yep. Well, and here's why I asked that. So, so my good friends, Karen and David at Film Courage, when they reached out to me, um, I don't know, a month or two ago, and they said, hey, would you be willing to, you know, do a, like a lecture on um, independent film? I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, what should I talk about? And they're like, whatever you want. I'm like, wow, independent film, that's like, that's like a pretty big topic. You know, that's like, talk about the universe, you know? <laughs> um, so I was like, well, maybe we can narrow this down. What if you guys asked your subscribers and viewers, like, what? they want me to talk about instead of just talking about what I want to talk about because maybe what I want to talk about is not what you guys want to hear. And they were like, that's a great idea. So they reached out to, you know, and they've got a pretty good subscriber base and uh, they got a lot of feedback and we've got you know, all kinds of questions. Can you talk about this? Can you ask him this? And so I tried to tailor an outline to what those questions were. Um, and so it's just in terms of the kind of things that uh, people asked and what we're going to, I put together an outline based on those based on those questions. And so the kind of things that people were were asking about was, you know, advice from, um, you know, to writers from um, from a producer's perspective. You know, how do I get a producer's attention if I don't have a lot of credits? How do I approach a producer? Um, you know, uh, what does a producer look for? You know, in, in a script. And I mean, it's sort of some of these questions were pretty broad, so I tried to sort of like you know focus them. Um, and then just sort of like the indie, um, you know, sort of production process from uh, development through production, financing, uh, that sort of thing. So, so I tried to create an outline based on the questions that I got and tried to, try to uh, you know, answer as many of those as I could. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go through those. Um, so, those questions. so basically, that's why I asked you guys to you know why we're here, because really it came from you guys, um, so to speak. Um, so first, you know, I, you know the, the idea here is to help you guys get your pictures made. That's, that's the name of the game. That's like the first piece of advice I want to give is like, get the picture made. So you guys are probably thinking like, yeah, like, duh, Mark, of course, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the picture made. But when I say that, I don't mean from an outside perspective. I don't mean, you know, go out and try to raise money. I mean, try to get the picture made. Internally, mentally, you have to, in your head, you have to think, okay, I'm going to do what I got to do to get the picture made. You got to get out of your own way. And this is a mistake that I made early on in my career was a lot of times um, I had several, several opportunities where I had a chance to get a picture made and I, ha I wanted to do it the way that I wanted to do it and I sort of you know, ignored other possible opportunities. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example because um, stories are fun. So I had this, this, this project called High Midnight um, many, many years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago that it went in a turnaround from Screen Gems and I got a hold of this project. And it was about vampires in the Old West. And it was like, I thought it was so cool. And it was before all these sort of, there was no hybrid like, you know, vampire. There was no like 30 days of night, vampires in Alaska, you know, there were priests or all these like vampires in, vampires in this. There was, it was kind of very new. There was maybe John Carpenter's vampires, which had sort of an old west, but, but it was sort of a fresh concept. And it was like the, this cool sort of 1892 New Mexico, um, this rundown sheriff teams up with this, this European vampire hunter who's been tracking these vampires from Europe. 
and they've been going across the U.S. and the Old West, like terrorizing towns. And so this sort of you know rundown, washed-up sheriff teams up with this vampire hunter to stop this this clan of vampires. And I was like, this is that's so cool. I'm going to get this made. I want to get this made on like on like a big level, right? And I got the project set up with anonymous content. And at the time, they had done maybe Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and they had done maybe they were shooting Fifty First Dates with Adam Sandler. I think that was all they had done at the time. They've done a lot since then, but. Um, I got it set up there. I'm like, this is great. I'm going to get this. You know, I, I was just over the moon. I'm, I'm going to get this picture made on this, you know, big level. And then my executive left. And as soon as your executive leaves, you know, it's like a lot of times your project dies, right? Mm -hmm. So I took it back. I said, I'm going to make it myself. That's fine. I'm going to make it for like $10 million and we get it made myself. And, and my partner and I had raised some seed capital and we hired this big casting director, Bonnie Timmerman. And she helped us get like, Vincent D'Onofrio and Elizabeth Hurley attached and Thomas Kretschmann and like Ted Raimi. Like this is like good cast, you know, for a genre picture, for a horror picture. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get this thing made. And we found this town up in Canada and we were like, yeah, this is, you know, we're gonna do this. And year after year, I kept going out, chasing the money, chasing the money, switching out actors, switching out directors. Rachel Lee Cook, we had, a, we had a lot of actors on it. And I still couldn't get the money together. And then one day, Sci-Fi Channel comes to me and they're like, we'll give you $750,000 to make this movie. And I'm like, Fuck off, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. It like literally was like you know like screw you, and they were like okay, like they didn't care, you know, and so um, and so years later, what do you think happened? Still hadn't made the movie, um, and I started like thinking. I was like, you know, why couldn't I get out of my own way? Like I learned that lesson too late. It's like just get the picture made. I know a lot of people are like they want to do it this way. It's got to have this actor. It's got to be on this level, but a lot of times, especially early in your career, if you have that project that's that's really close and near and dear to your heart. Sometimes it's just better to put it in a drawer and then work on something else. You know, if you really, that one has to be made a certain way, go work on something else. But get the picture made. Um, and I could have done it for 750. I could have made it really, I'm sure I could have made it pretty darn good. You know, better than Sharknado. So, um, so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to, to kind of mention to you guys. Um, you know, and the second thing is, well, you know, obviously a lot of what you're going to hear tonight is subjective. It's, you know, it's, it's my experiences. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, and it's, uh, you know, not everything is, I, I made a lot of mistakes. So you're going to learn from some of the mistakes that, that I've made. And so that, that would be my other piece of advice to you guys is go out and make some, make some mistakes. Go make some mistakes. Go fail. I know it sounds weird. But go out and fail a little bit. Go, re go get rejected because it's going to happen. Get used to it. I just, I was trying to set up an, a project with Hallmark Channel. I, I'd done a movie with them several years back. Try, I was trying to set up another movie with them this year. Just found out, I think, well, yesterday, uh, that they're passing on it. I was like, so close. But that's part of the game. I was like, okay, well, okay, move on. But, you know, the head of development over there, I know her, she's like, but if you have a Christmas thing or whatever, like, I'll, you know, I'll look at it. Like, I have the door open, that's fine. So go out and fail, you know, and go out and make some mistakes. Um, so I think just first before we get in the outline, I'm just going to quickly I'm just going to quickly talk about myself a little bit just so you know who you're who you're listening to and just just briefly how I got here and my background. So so you know I, I'm like a sort of a, a product of the '80s. That's so I grew up like I, so I saw Ghostbusters in the theater in 1984 and I was like that's what I want to do. Like I didn't know exactly what I wanted, but I wanted to make movies. I saw a movie four times in the theater in 1984 when I was like seven years old. I'm like this is what I want to do. So those kind of Ghostbusters, Goonies, Back to the Future, Beverly Hills Cop, Karate Kid, Crocodile Dundee, Police Academy, that, that was like my era. That's the movies that, that made me want to make movies. And I remember my grandfather tells me, seven years old, he's like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I'm like, oh, sounds pretty good. So wasn't the best student, but managed to somehow eventually get out here, go to Santa Barbara. I applied to UCLA, they rejected me. I applied to USC, got in, but didn't get into the film school. Got in UC Santa Barbara, which is yeah, still a good school. Not as like they're like way up here now, but when I went there, like, they were good. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I want to get to UC Santa Barbara. And my dad says, trust me, you'll like it. I'd never been to Santa Barbara. Had no idea what it was. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not a production school. He's like, you'll like it. I'm like, but it's so far away from LA. And my dad's like, trust me, you'll like it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. I knew nothing about it. <laughs> nothing. I'm playing from Philadelphia. I'm coming from Philadelphia. So talk about night and day, right? Philadelphia. Fly in, in the cab, driving through campus, like girls in bikinis, surfboards, riding bikes, palm trees. I'm like, wow. I hit the honey pot, you know? And I, I mean, I got on the payphone as soon as I got there, called my best, you know, one of my best friends. No cell phones. This was like in the 90s. And I was like, you won't believe where I am. This is amazing. And it was, it was like the best two years of my life. Um, made a lot of relationships. 
Um, but still, when I got done, I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I moved down here. Uh, I met up with an old buddy of mine uh, from Santa Barbara. And he says to me, and this is like 2000, and he says to me, um, I got a band that's going to give me like six grand to do a music video. Do you want to direct it? That's like, so do you want to direct it? I was like, I tried directing at Santa Barbara, and I don't think I was very good at it. I just didn't think I was a good director. And I said, I don't think I want to do that, but I'll tell you what, I'll produce it with you. And he's like, oh, cool, okay. So we, um, we went about and we did this band for this group called The Real Seduction. They were MC Hammer's backup dancers, but they went on their uh, R&B group. Um, really great voices. Um, and so we did this, this video. And we're like, wow, we're, we're pretty good at this video. It's pretty sweet. Um, so we started doing more. And we put together a company called Treasure Entertainment. And, uh, and we incorporated in 01. We started in 2000, we incorporated in 01. And, uh, and then I got a chance to interview at UCLA to be in the producers program. Um, I applied, they take like eight, they had like 800 and some applicants. They bring 40 people into interview. And so they called me in as one of the 40. And so I brought in a portfolio of the company I was building, like this whole folder with like profiles of, you know, the, the things we were doing, the projects we were doing, business card. And most people don't come into the interviews at school do, already having started a company. And they were like, wow, you know, uh, and they asked me to wait outside and then they brought me back in. They said, well, we can't tell you this officially, but you're in. I'm like, oh, great. So went to the UCLA producers program, got my master's um, while I was building my company. So thank you, student loans, because uh, that kept me going while I built my company. Uh, graduated in 03 with my master's and then from 03 to 07, uh, you know, continued to build my company with my partner, we did dozens and dozens of music videos. So once you get that first one going, you start to put a reel together, someone else says, oh, we'll do mine. And next thing you know, we get a reel together, and we start doing commercials. And then we started branching into features. That was always the, uh, you know, the idea uh, was to do features. So, um, so we did that. Uh, and then, um, and, and by the way, while I'm doing this, I'm, I'm, I'm doing other jobs. From 03 to like 07, I'm a runner, I'm an assistant, I'm doing extra work. I'm like, whatever I can to make money while I'm doing these videos and we're running around Sunset Boulevard hustling, hitting up bands, trying to get whatever we can, you know, whatever we can. Uh, and I'm telling you this, this story because I want you guys to know that I was doing the same thing that you guys are doing. Like it's, you know, it's, it, it, you have to start somewhere. And it's, there's nothing to be ashamed of running around, you know, do, doing whatever you can do, you know, while you're trying to get your project made. So, um, so at the end of the day, uh, we built this company up and we, you know, in 08, which I know was a bad year for a lot of people, it was a great year for Treasure Entertainment, the company that I, that I built with my, my partner. So by 08, seven years in, um, you know, we, we grossed over a million dollars in revenues. We were getting a lot of music videos, um, you know, Janelle Monet, John Michael Montgomery, Snoop Dogg. I mean, we were doing videos for like big, you know, big artists. Um, and we had, we had a few features under our belt, all, you know, under a million bucks. Um, and by 2011, I was sort of starting to get burnt out on the, the corporate thing, you know, because I was spending more time trying to run the company than just creating product. And so in 2011, I, I, I stepped down. Um, a lot of the other officers decided to step down as well. The company wound up folding, but I just, I just wanted to, to go freelance. So what I did is I started working for people like you, like being hired. And actually, I met Will, for example. We, I was introduced by a friend, and Will wanted to make, make a film. And, Will had a generous benefactor, and, and we wound up, uh, you know, Will wound up bringing me onto his project as, as the producer. So as that's um, uh, from 2011 until now, that's what I've been doing, is I've been working at a, as a freelance producer. So, um, and I just, I get hired. I tell people I'm usually the kind of guy that gets hired by people who have a script, and they have money, and they have no idea what to do with it. And they, they, you know, how do I take it from here to here? Or I just want to direct. You know, the, that, that's a lot of the kind of people I get, or, you know, it's just, you know, I've got the money, but I don't want to focus on the day-to-day -day producing. And I get a lot of clients like that. Um, I also managed writers for eight years while I was at Treasure Entertainment. So in addition to producing, I was managing writers. So, so a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about comes from, um, uh, comes from that. And I think, I think a, a good thing to remember, too, is that, um, you know, and the fact that I'm making a living doing this, I mean, is, is, it, it is a dream come true. You know, I'm making a living doing what I love to do, just like my grandfather said. So, um, but every producer is not good at everything. So I think that's something to, to be aware of. So for me, like, I hate raising money. Like, I'm not very good at it. I don't think I'm very good at it, but I've done it. Um, I'm going to talk about it, but it's not something I enjoy doing. So there's, there's things I enjoy doing. Development, working with the writers, I enjoy doing. Um, production, I enjoy doing. Um, 
uh, you know, working in marketing and distribution. I like those aspects, like this hands-on, I hate raising money. Um, so I think development, that's probably a good place to sort of get into this outline. Um, so some people were asking me about how to get to, a uh, get to a producer as a writer, especially a writer without a lot of, um, without a lot of credits. And I got a few questions about like lifestyle advice, which I thought was kind of funny. And, and so like one of the questions was, do I need to live in LA? You know, well, you guys are already here, so you guys are like, well, whatever. But for the people watching, yeah, people watching the video, um, no. Number one, you don't need to be a uh, to live in LA to be a writer. Part two, yes, you need to be in LA to be a writer if you want to work. So what I mean by that is you, you can write from anywhere. Obviously, you know, if you have a computer in Final Draft, now that doesn't make you a writer any more than being having a body makes you an actor, right? But it's a craft. We all know that. But it's all things being relative, let's say you're a good writer. Yeah, you can have Final Draft, you can have a laptop, and you can write from anywhere. But if you want to um, be a working writer, you, you need to live in a production city. You need to live in LA. You need to live in New York because you need to be able to take meetings. You need to be able to meet with the director. You need to be able to be on set doing rewrites. You need to be able to network. If you're doing TV, you need to be in the writer's room. You, you need to be here to, to, to do that. Um, you know, you might hear the story about the kid uh, from Boston who sold a spec script or whatever. He still lives in Boston. That's fine. That's one sale. But if you want to be a regular working writer, yeah, I, I would advise that um, you, you're, that you live here, um, you know, to do those meetings, to do those rewrites. Uh, so I think that's kind of an important um, important aspect. Um, I also got a question about: Is it important? Believe it or not, is it important to have a good attitude? Does that mean something? <laughs> like, when is that not a good thing? Right? When is that not a good thing? When, like, yeah, it's, it's okay to have a bad attitude in this job. I mean, and some writers might just think, you know, like, like editors are similar too, it's like they lock themselves away in a room and they don't have to, you know, interface with people a lot. But um, yes, of course, you know, having a good attitude is, is important. Um, it's important because I think, you know, from a producer, uh, producer's perspective, you're selling yourself, remember you're selling yourself as much as you're selling the script, sometimes more. Because as a producer, I'm looking at a writer and I'm thinking like, I got to work with this guy for the next nine months or twelve months or two years. Like, do I, you know, do I really? I've actually have turned down projects because I'm like, I don't think I'm going to mesh. I, if I don't like this guy, he's probably not going to like me. Um, on the flip side of that coin, I've worked with writers that I kind of, you know, like I really liked them. The project was like, eh. remember I had um, these these two writing clients um, that some, that I read this script um, prom date, um, and it was like. I like teen comedies. I've always liked teen com American Pie, those kind of movies. And I was like, that kind of like teen comedy. I'm like, it really needs some work. And maybe otherwise I'd pass on. But I really like these guys. These guys are funny. I want to work with them. So I took them on as clients. And we worked together. And we, I wound up producing um, one of them I still work with now. Uh, I'm friends with both of them. One of them I produced four of his movies. So we still work together. Um, and uh, and it, I just took that. I took that. Um, I took them on as clients because I liked them. So, so yeah, a good attitude is important. It's not just about your work. It's, a, it's, it's about selling yourself. And sometimes more, more important than selling the script. Um, and then, you know, some people just, again, they ask me, you know, how do, how do I know? Again, I've spent 15, 8, whatever, 16 years dealing, um, dealing with and working with writers. Um, a big part of my uh, education at UCLA was development. Uh, my development professor, Meg Lafoe, she was Jodie Foster's producing partner at Egg Pictures. Gen she's a genius. She wrote um, Inside Out, which was up for the, uh, the Disney um, film, which well, I guess was nominated for some Oscars. She's just really, really smart when it comes to stories. So learned a lot from her and, you know, like I said, managed writers for eight years and then, again, continuing to, to work with, with uh, independent filmmakers as a producer as well. So, so yeah, lifestyle-wise, have a good attitude, yes. And if you want to be a regular working writer, yes, you should live in L.A. Um, appro approaching a producer uh, without having a lot of credit. So a few questions that, that you guys can, can sort of ask. Um, first thing as a writer, so for those of you guys who are writers, um, you should ask is, is, does that producer have a track record of making uh, the type of movies you're looking to make? It's one of the biggest things, man. I got to say in Treasure Entertainment, I'd get query letters. And we did like niche, like niche genre, sort of lower budget, you know, horror, comedy, you know, it had to be some sort of like niche genre kind of film. I get like queries for $75 million period epics, like this isn't what we do. 
And uh, now, uh, especially now, like in the, in the sort of digital age, I mean, you guys have like this information at your fingertips, really no reason not to know who you're querying, right? So don't send the blanket queries out to everybody because it's going to get deleted. You're, I mean, you're wasting your time if you're not querying the appropriate people. So look at the people you're querying, like, do they do this kind of budget level? You know, okay, this, like, and you guys, I mean, you guys work in this industry, you gotta you have a kind of an idea of the budget levels of your movies. Like you know whether this is a low budget movie or a big budget, Fast and Furious or whatever, you kind of know. So are they doing these kind of budget levels? Um, is this the genre they're working at? Like you're not gonna go to Jason Blum with like a Will Ferrell comedy, you know? Like so, genre, budget, is it indie versus studio? That's a big deal too, you know, is it an indie production company or is it, you know, they have a studio deal, do they do big studio pictures? And, you know, style, is this the kind of style that the, these guys are making? You know, so if, it, I think that's gonna cut out a lot of sort of wasted time is just first target to, target the producer based on what you know they're making. Do a little research, you've got, you know, IMDB, you've got Wikipedia, you've got just Googling them. Um, is going to save you a lot of time. Number two, you know, do, do, do these producers have a history of working with up and coming writers? It's a lot of things people don't think about. They're like, oh, I just want to get to this. And you look at their, the, this producer's credits and they have 25 credits and not one of them is with an up and coming writer. They're all with big name writers. Like, you're probably not going to have much of a shot, you know, just realistically. Um, you know, but you might also look at some of these credits and say, oh, look at this guy. Like, you know, this, this writer only had like two credits and now like the second credit is with this big, okay, maybe they're working with, with bigger name, uh, with a, a smaller name, uh, bigger name producers working with smaller writers. So I think that's, um, that's also something to, to consider. Um, third, and this is also a big one, um, do they take unsolicited material? So most of the bigger companies don't. So how do you get around that? Um, and that's, that's one of the tricks. So a couple things. If you don't have a relationship there, because that's always one way, is you want to get an agent or a manager or an attorney to submit it for you. If you have one of them, you, know, you, can, get, you can kind of get through the gatekeepers. The easiest out of those three, I, in my experience, is an attorney. You can find it, because you can hire an entertainment attorney on a retainer. You can get somebody. Again, you know, you gotta, sometimes you've got to pony up a little bit of dough. I mean, you're investing in your future, right? But if you're willing to sort of, you know, to, to hire an entertainment attorney, you might be able to, get, you know, get them to get you in the door. Uh, the reason for that is because most most production companies, they might have similar ideas in development. They might have similar projects that they're working on, and so they don't want you to come sue them if they make that similar project that they already had. And you say, oh, you stole my idea. They know if it comes from an attorney or an agent or a legitimate manager that that's not going to happen because that that agent or manager or attorney knows the protocol. And they're going to say to you, "Look, no, we submitted, you know, through this process. You got, you can't go sue them now. They, you know, so they're, they're, they they understand that there's sort of a little bit of product, protection there. So I think, um, you know, it, it, you might have a few companies that are willing to 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 take a look at your project if you sign a release form based on a really good pitch. But for the ones that aren't, you you, you got to you have to get a, an advocate to get you through that door, agent, manager, or or attorney. Again, agents, managers are looking for clients." you know, based on sort of more creative um, parameters. But an attorney, you know, they take scripts from attorneys. So that, that to me is the easiest because there's not as much of a creative qualifier with an attorney. It's more of a money thing. So uh, that's the way to, that you might be able to get through that door. Um, also, you know, what, what kind of producer is the person that you want to approach? So, so there's a lot of different types of producers uh, out there. Um, you know, do they work for hire? So, like, I'm the kind of producer I work for hire, right? So I don't go out there just like trying to like raise money and chop scripts. Like people hire me. Um, you know, is that producer more of an EP or a money guy, like an executive producer? Because they might be like, why, well, you, you know, like, are you coming to me to find talent or whatever? Um, are they a post producer, line producer? I mean, you know, uh, talent manager. Some producers, like, oh, this guy's a producer on this movie. He's only a producer because he managed the actor. And he said, I want a producer credit. If you want my actor, this happened to me when I worked for Bobby Newmeyer. Um, so, Bo and Bobby was a great, he was a great training guy. I worked for him just before I went to UCLA. And Bobby produced Training Day, uh, Santa Claus, and the quintessential indie film that started everything, as the, the indie movement as we know it. Bobby produced the movie that started that movement, which was Sex, Lies, and Videotape back in 89. Um, so he was a great mentor. And um, I remember, so like, it's funny, um, but he, we were doing a movie called National Security uh, with Martin Lawrence and Steve Zahn. And, um, you know, Martin Lawrence's manager said to Bobby, you know, like, if you want Martin, um, I want to produce, I want to be a producer. It was like, that's it, you want Martin? I'm a producer. So, 
you know, it's it not like he had a specific tangible, like you knew physical production or you knew script development. Um, you know, sometimes they're a distribution person. What, but know the producer that you're going to, because if they're like, oh, they're just the, the, the they're the money guy, but they only deal with, you know, this company or whatever. Like, hey, I don't, I don't you know, I mean, know who you're dealing with, you know, or if they just do post or whatever. Like, hey, I'm not the right guy. Um, and then think about what assets you have to leverage. Um, Financing obviously is is one possible asset, and a lot of people say, "Well, if I had financing, I wouldn't need them." But that's not necessarily true. Sometimes you have a little bit of financing, and you need somebody to take that little bit and make it bigger. Um, so if you have a little bit of financing, a lot of producers will sit up and take notice. I I have a relationship with um, two producers who do very very big films, like Mel Gibson, Bruce Willis, these sort of action films. The ones that you see sort of on Netflix, you're like, I never heard of that, but it's like Bruce Willis, you know, those. That cost like 15 million bucks, and you're like, well, I never went to the theaters, though. Um, and they say, they're like, just come with like a million bucks, and we can take it from there. If you have like just like a million, we can, we can use that, and we can get to 10 or 12. So, you know, it, what kind of can you leverage a little bit of finance? And that's just one example. Maybe you have 100,000, you can leverage it to a million. Um, and we're going to get into financing in a, uh, a little bit later. But um, talent attachments, again, especially, you know, you're an actor, um, you're taking classes with, you know, sometimes there's like other name actors, um, you have a friend who's an assistant at CAA, who knows? But you can, get, you know, talent attachments, name director, um, do you have underlying rights? to a really interesting person's life story, a book. Um, if you have some sort of asset to leverage, and I would say a really good underlying story is one of the easiest things to get to. I have, um, again, a mutual friend of Will and I, uh, Eric. Um, he went and he got rights to this really cool story called Panama Unit. It was a true life it was in the newspaper about these, um, I guess they were like some sort of uh, law enforcement in the t on the Texas border that wound up working with the drug cartels and like smuggling drugs themselves and then the cops had to bring them down um, like they kind of became bad guys you know and he optioned this the life rights of like one of the guys or something and set it up with a pretty big producer but he didn't have a lot of assets or a lot of resources but he found something he could leverage so you know think about the things the kind of things you could leverage a book an article life rights you found a really interesting person you can option their life rights you can option an article or you have a little bit of financing, um, or again, some sort of name. Those are the kind of things that can help you get through that door. And by the way, it doesn't need to be based on like a, a, a best-selling book or um, you know, a big video game or something. A lot of times, you know, producers are interested in that sort of undiscovered, really like, wow, this is really cool. Um, I never even heard of this. Um, and the reason that producers like those things is because they know we know it already. There's already an audience there. I mean, if, if especially if it's if, if it is a book or it's something that it's, that already has like sort of a following. It's like, well, okay, I know there's an audience. I know who my audience is. So again, approaching a producer without having a lot of a lot of credits. Look at their track record. Are they making the kind of movies you want to make? Are they um, do they have a history of working with up and coming writers um, that don't have a lot of credits? Do they take unsolicited material, and if they don't, can you get to an attorney that can help you get through that door? Um, and um, are they the right kind of producer? And what do you have to leverage? Those are the best ways to, to sort of get in the, in the door. If you have those, um, if you have answers to all of those questions, I think you have a pretty good shot. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, and it might, again, you're gonna go out and you're gonna fail. It's gonna happen. You're gonna go out and it might take you a year or two years. You gotta keep plugging. You have to keep plugging. Um, another question I got was, what do I look for in a script? Specifically, they were asking, what does Mark look for in a script? Um, so I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself, and it's probably semi-universal. Um, first, is it well-written? And when I say well-written, the first thing I mean is, like, just the quality of the, the prose itself. Is it polished? Or is the formatting off, spelling, grammar? That drives me nuts. Um, like if it doesn't even read like it's, I get, I've gotten query letters in the past that don't read like they're even written by a native English speaker and I'm, I'm having trouble getting through. Why would I read your 100 page script? I can't even read your query letter. So query letters, yes, make sure they're well written, but, this, but that, that's gonna be my first indication of whether the script's gonna be well written. Um, but that's just like, I tell you guys, if you, if you just polish your scripts and make sure, give it to a friend to read or, or step away from it for five days and go back and read it and go over all of those mistakes, use Grammarly, something. That's going to set you above like 40% of the scripts right there. It's just like, wow, it's just tightly written. The prose is strong. Um, 
you know, there's not a lot of, you know, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, formatting mistakes. Second, you know, I'd say as part of being well-written is how strong are the characters, that's the next thing. Um, and, and this isn't necessarily an order of importance, it's just the things I notice first. First, I just notice the, the quality of writing. Next thing I notice are the characters, like protagonist, ag antagonist, are they interesting? Do they have goals? Do they have flaws? Um, you know, what's, what's sort of the arc of the character? Do they change? Um, nothing bug, personally bugs me more than a, a script with a character that doesn't change. That's why there was like um, that movie with George Clooney up in the air. Everyone liked this movie and I was like, I just don't like it. Like, why? I'm like, George Clooney doesn't change in the end. He's the exact same person at the end of that movie that he was at the beginning. The movie just bugged me for some reason. And that was it, um, as an example. But um, nothing against George Clooney, but, uh, but yeah. That, so, you know, those kind of things, character arc, um, you know, and, and these are the kind of things you can read about in books is how to create that sort of stuff. But just that's what I look for is strong characters, characters that change. Um, what's the concept is a concept that intrigues me, you know, um, and that's going to be subjective. I can't tell you what that concept's going to be, so um, it's going to change from producer to producer. Um, but I look at the narrative through line. I look at the structure. Is it, you know, does it have a, a you know, I'm a three-act structure guy. I mean, it's, it's not like if you don't have a strong three-act structure, someone's going to call you out and say, wait, your second act low point doesn't happen on page 90 like it's supposed to. They're not going to say that, but what an agent at CAA will do is you'll get the feedback that, yeah, it's, it's just not what they're used to reading. Like, yeah, it's just not really for us. It just didn't feel, it doesn't feel like the kind of stuff. They won't give you that specific note. Oh, the midpoint came too late. They'll just tell you it doesn't really feel like, you know, the kind of thing that's right for our client or it's not the kind of thing they're used to reading. That's why it's kind of important, at least at the beginning, to play by those rules. You know, you want to break the three-act structure rules. Do it once you're known. But at the beginning, play by the rules. Then somebody can break the rules. And maybe somebody can make the rules. You get big enough, I guess. Oh, no, I'm not there. But... Breaking the rules, yeah, it's, you know, once you once you get to that level, that's uh, you know that that's that's fun. But but at, at, the, at the beginning, play by the rules, you know, so they understand that you like Quentin Tarantino. You know, I remember reading um, Kill Bill. It was one script. It was one movie. It was like 297 pages. I read it in one sitting because the writing was so interesting. In the action line, it said something like, yeah, I can't remember Uma Thurman's name, but uh, in the in the movie, uh, the it was like a it was like a nickname. You remember what her name was? What was it? The the something. The bride, yeah, they call the bride. The bride picks up the fucking gun. It says that in the action line. <laughs> picks up the fucking gun. And I was like, and if I got that from like a lesser known writer, I'd be like, how amateur. But because it's Quentin Tarantino's voice, I'm like, oh yeah. And it kind of made sense, like, yeah, she doesn't pick up, she picks up the fucking gun. Yeah, I get it. So kind of know who your, you know, who your, who your audience is. But, but show you can play by the rules first. So, so if I get a script with, you know, it's well written, it's got, you know, um, strong characters that have an arc, have goals, have flaws, um, strong structure, strong concept. Yeah, that's, 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 that's first and foremost. I'm going to first get that through the query. Maybe I'll say, give me a synopsis or a treatment. And then if I see it in the treatment, I'll read the script. Um, theme is a big thing. What's the theme? So what's the message? Why are you telling this story? Why? Like, you know, can, I mean, are, you, are we supposed to learn something from it? And not every film has to be some super self-important thing. Sometimes it can just be fun, but there should be some reason why you're telling it. You know, some, some sort of message that you're getting across. Um, so I kind of look at it and I go, is this a story or a subject I care about? And it could be just, like I said, that teen comedy prom date. I mean, just this kid finding his confidence. Well, that's cool. You know, and it was really funny. It's like this old light, this is like, it's light. It, it'll make people laugh. Um, and I liked what this kid was about, you know, what this kid was about. And it was, it was sim a simple story and I thought people could identify with it. So it's something that I personally care about. So I look at the theme. Again, if you research your producer and you know who you're pitching, um, you might get an idea of what they're into by looking at the credits and going, hey, I think I see a similar theme in the other movies that they've done. Um, and then, you know, uh, and somebody had, had asked me too, they said, um, can, <laughs> Specifically, they said, can be edgy, even if I'm alienating a lot of my audience. You know, so I don't know specifically what they were talking about. Maybe it's a political thing or whatever. They said, I might be alienating a lot of my audience. Should I do it? I said, sure. As long as you feel like there's a large enough audience to justify the budget, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it's like you look at like birth control is a good example. You mean birth control, a lot of, um, you know, devout Christians don't like birth control, but it still sells because there's enough people that still like it. Okay. But you're, you know, a lot of people don't like it. There's enough people that still justify making it, right? It's the same thing with a movie, right? I mean, if there's enough 
of an audience to justify, oh, okay, you alienate a bunch of people. That's a lot of people are like, oh, you're gonna alienate these people. So what if you have an audience over here and they can justify your budget? You meaning you, you can make enough, the enough return based on this group of people? Well, make your movie. Um, producer friendly is another thing I look at. So so what would it take to to to, to take this over the finish line? Um, producer friendly being like if I get a script on it. Say, yeah, well, okay, so I need to get Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins to make this work, and I have to build this giant inverted pyramid in the middle of Los Angeles, and I need to have 4,000 pounds of fake snow brought in, and I might look at this and go, this is gonna be too much of a challenge, this is gonna be too much of a pain. Um, not that I'm not into a challenge, but I might just look at that and say, this is not, this is gonna be too, too, too for the budget or whatever, it's just not producer friendly. It's not, not something I think I can pull off personally or for the money or what have you. So, so being, being producer friendly, is it, can it easily be produced at least in the budget range I'm working in or what I'm used to doing is, is something that I'm going to look at. Um, validation is a big thing. So um, does it come highly recommended from someone that I know and trust? Like I have a good friend, Mark. He's a, a judge for the Nichols Fellowship. If Mark says to me, read this, dude, this is really good. I'm going to read it. You know, I mean, it's like the Nichols Fellowship. I mean, the guy, you know, it's one of the biggest contests. And, that, and that's another thing. Has it won any contests? Even if it doesn't maybe come from someone like Mark, um, if, you know, you came to me and you said, you know, um, at least a quarter, maybe a semifinalist in Nichols, Sundance Lab, um, you know, Blue Cat, Austin, Final Drafts, Big Break, some of the bigger ones. The smaller ones don't mean anything, I'm telling you. I mean, they don't mean anything, nothing. The bigger ones, it's not like one of these things where if you do really well in, in 30 small ones, it means something. It means more to do bi well in one big one than to do well in a bunch of small ones. So just don't waste your time with the small ones. I actually wrote an article about this on a, um, a um, site called Funds for Writers, Funds, F-U-N-D-S, Funds for Writers, um, and uh, about screenplay competitions. And I interviewed my buddy Mark. and. You know, ask some questions about like, hey, tell me about a little bit about how the inside of this world works, screenplay competition judging, um, and got you know some did some research and put together what I thought was the ten best. Um, but that's validation um, because those top screenplay competitions are at the top, not just because of the big cash prizes, which is nice, but also because the judges are well known, you know, people. So I don't know who's judging little, you know, bumblefuck um, competition of, you know, Duluth or whatever. I don't know who's judging that, but I know who's judging Nichols. I know who's judging Sundance. So that, that's validation. You know, has anyone notable signed on? That's also validation. You know, um, I got the, a project set up with Hallmark Channel because I got Luke Perry attached and um, Daryl Sabara, who was the kid in Spy Kids, or orange curly-haired kid. Um, and they didn't wind up using either of them because Daryl got too old and Luke was on another movie when they wanted to make it. So they made it with John Schneider and... Um, the kid from Kicking and Screaming with Will Fer Ferrell, I forget what his name is, Dylan McLaughlin. So, so we wound up making it with a different cast, but I got it in the door because Luke Perry. Because Hallmark's like, Luke Perry! Like they love, you know, TV movie, yeah, Luke Perry. So, um, so I think the, part of validation is, you know, does come highly recommended from someone you know, has it won a contest, a major contest, does it have somebody attached? That, that's, that, those are examples of validation. And of course money. Um, does it have financing attached? And if so, how much? And what kind? So, uh, you know, so again, m movies get made um, a lot of times with, and we're going to get into financing, but it doesn't, you don't have to have all of your equity to make a movie. You want to make a million dollar movie and you have 100,000. I was um, working on a movie called Don McKay, um, and that's many years ago. And the writer came to me, he had 100 grand. Um, and the, you know, I think the budget of the movie, we, we wanted to do it for like 3 million, but he had like 100 grand. Um, and we used that hundred grand to hire a casting director, Linda Paolo, and she had done The Rainmaker and like one of the Jeepers Creepers movies and Virgin Suicides, like big movies. We paid her just a, uh, a, enough to get us one actor, like, get me one actor. And we took that hundred grand, we had it in an account so we could show it to an agent, show it it was real, and we made offers to, I think we went to like, you know, Patricia Clarkson, uh, Jeff Daniels, uh, Holly Hunter, went to like a bunch of big, and, and because we had money and we had a legitimate casting director, they read it. We got real feedback, like Holly said this, you know, she really liked it, but we got a meeting with Marsha Gay Harden. I mean, it was like, you know, it's a $3 million movie. Um, 
this is right after Sideways. You guys remember Sideways, right? You know, Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden. Thomas Hayden Church is like the, the biggest thing in town at that moment. Thomas Hayden Church reads the script because I want to do this. And we had made a partial pay or play offer, which is pay or play means you get paid whether the movie gets made or not, you know, as an actor. So if I made, if I made you a pay or play offer, it means hey, even if I don't hit my targeted start date, you get paid. So, yeah, it works, right? That's pay or play. But you don't have to have all of the salary to make a pair play. So say Thomas Hayden Church, I don't, I don't know what his fee was on the movie. Say it was 150 grand. We go to his agent, we say, listen, we're gonna make a partial pair play. 50 grand guaranteed just to say yes. If, if we make the movie, gets the other 100. He gets 50 grand just to say yes. So you can leverage some of that movie. Nice thing about Thomas Hayden Church, a very nice guy, he didn't take the money. Even though the, he said yes, we didn't hit the start date, but he's like, just let me know when you have the money. And the movie eventually did get made, by the way, you can rent it. Um, but it was, um, and I wasn't actually, I didn't wind up being a producer on it. I helped put the package together, but another person wound up uh, producing the film. But, but again, we wound up leveraging 100,000, the movie got made for like three million bucks. And we got Thomas Hayden Church and Keith David and a bunch of cool, like before we had all the financing. Uh, and that, that guy wound up getting to direct the movie as well. So he wanted to direct it. And I backed him as a director because he had a strong vision for it. He really had a strong vision for it. So when I say, does it have any financing attached, you don't have to have all your money. People are like, well, I don't have a million bucks. Yeah, but do you have 50 grand? Do you have 100 grand? You might be able to turn that into something. Um, and, uh, and then I guess, like, you know, kind of, you know, people were asking me, you know, well, what, what, you know, specifically what would I look at? Um, if it doesn't have financing, and I said, look, you know, again, I work for hire, I don't really shop scripts, but if it had a really interesting log line, um, and, and it was a genre picture that I knew I, right now I could set up somewhere, yeah, I'd probably take a look at it. You know, Hallmark, again, I keep using that example because I have that relationship there. It's like somebody pitched me a really good Hallmark story, like I know I could just walk that in at any point. And it's a quick, I can set it up. And here, the thing about Hallmark is they make everything that they buy. Nothing goes into development hell there. They don't. I think in like five years, they like, when I was talking to my friend there, she was like, yeah, one time we didn't make the movie because I know something happened. But like one time out of like, they make like 100 movies a year. So that's why I like them. Um, so anyway, look, what do I look for in the script? That, that's, you know, that, that's the answer. So I, I wanted to get a little bit into the um, indie producing, the development stage of, of actual, uh, in some indie producing. Um, what should I focus on when trying to get a film off the ground? This is what people ask me. So he, here's some specific steps that I have had success with in trying to get a film off the ground. First, first and foremost, script. Make sure your script is strong. Spend time in development. Um, and when I say spend time in development, I, again, I mean get validation from someone who's in the know, not your friends, not people who are going to tell you it's great. Tr go to some contests, see what the feedback, and, and pay a little extra money to get the feedback from the contest. It's worth it. The, the, the contest is 50 bucks, and for the extra five bucks or whatever, you can get the feedback. Um, or bigger name people, or you know, or somebody who's working in the industry. There's a lot of good coverage services out there, but get validation from somebody who knows. Not your best friend, not your cousin. You know, somebody knowledgeable and someone who's going to be tr tr honest with you. Um, you know, I had um, this, this, this kid, Rocco, out of New York, reached out to me through a mutual, I think a former client of mine, um, and he had the script called Worth the Fight. And it was like a boxing, you know, boxing movie, you know, kind of Rocky-esque, not really Rocky, but you know, kid is an underground street fighter trying to um, support his younger brother and sister and um, winds up getting pulled in the world of legitimate boxing, which is so anathema to him, and he has no idea. Um, you know, and he's trying to work his way up in that, trying to take his street fighting skills and work his way up as a boxer to support his family. I'm like, this is a cool script. Like, it needs a lot. It's rough. It needs work. But I started, you know, working with this kid um, and um, wound up developing the script with him over six or seven drafts. And wound up, like, really, and I wound up doing the final polish on it myself. And, you know, we actually have a, a company interested now that's, you know, we'll see. We'll see if it gets made. But uh, a possible route to getting that, that picture made. And, and, you know, it was like two years we worked, we worked together on that script. But, but we got the script in, in, in good shape now. And it was, it was worth it spending the two years. Because uh, I think it actually has a chance. Um, second, seed capital. That's the second thing. Um, is see if you can put together a little bit of money to launch um, development. How much? It depends on the scope and scale of your project. But again, I gave you that example. We got a $3 million picture made with $100,000 in seed capital. Um, where do you get that kind of money? Um, you know, obviously, the obvious ones are friends and family. Again, a lot of people I know, that's what they do. They go to friends and family. Um, get enough friends, enough family. Uh, savings, um, credit and loans, crowdfunding, which I'm not a fan of, I'll get into crowdfunding, but 
but people do it. Um, there is a, a company called Film Funding LA that helps you leverage. I'm, I'm not advocating for this one way or another, but I do know some people who have done it. Um, they help advocate your like your credit to help you get like a business loan, your personal credit to get a business loan, things like that. So there are ways to do it. Um, but again, you know, it's this is a business. You know, it's not show show. It's show business, and you got to invest in your business. Um, so sometimes, you know, you, you got to put a little bit of money where your mouth is. Um, and I, I'm not necessarily even saying invest your own money into this, but I'm saying, you know, sometimes you have to go out and put, you know, go, go reach out to some people who might believe in you and, and get them. I've never put $1 into a project ever in my entire career. I've never put $1 of my own money into, into a project. Um, but I've, I've groveled. I, I have groveled. Um, but that seed capital is kind of an important um, piece of this because it separates you from everybody else in this town um, that don't want to do that, you know. Um, if you have a good script, you have a little bit of seed capital. And again, maybe your movie could be done for 250000 you only have 25000 Still 10%. That's good. Um, so look at the scale of it. Third, supporting materials. So for, first, and when I say supporting materials, I mean your breakdown and schedule and budget and business plan. If you're going to go out and you're trying to put the, the project together, you need to have some sort of um, package to show people. So the first thing is you got to know your philosophy. Like what's, the, what's your, your producing philosophy? Um, I think, you know, with me, um, I, I'm always about trying to make dimes look like dollars on screen. That's like my philosophy. So, you know, it's some people, they want to put a bunch of money in above the line. I'm going to get the biggest actor I can and then I'll spend whatever's left. I'll just make the film, and, which I never find to be a good solution because if you get that big actor, they're going to come to set and be like, what the hell is this? It's not going to be the kind of production they're used to. Um, but there's different producing philosophies. You know, my philosophy is, is I you know, try to put as much of that money on the screen as possible. Um, and you know, it might be some people's producing philosophy, we're going to shoot 10 pages a day. Some people's producing philosophy, we're going to shoot two pages a day, but you know, I'm going to shoot it in one location. Figure out your producing philosophy. And then from there, you get, you know, if you, uh, if you can't do it, you hire a line producer, this kind of thing I do, that, that we, you know, we break it down, we do a schedule, we do a budget. Um, and you put together a business plan so that the people you're talking to understand your project and how you're going to leverage those assets you have if you have a little bit of money. All of that's going to be in your business plan. We already have 100000 out of our million. Um, fourth, director. Most of the time, cast is going to want to know who is directing. Um, if you have some credits, that's great. Um, if you don't, you know, it's tough. You're going to have, a, have to, you, you have to have a really strong script, a really strong vision, and probably some money. If you're going to get an, a, a name actor to sign on and you have no, you know, no real feature directing credits, so so getting to um, a name director because uh, cast is going to want to know. Um, again, that's some, somehow if you have if you have some of that seed capital, that's something that you can leverage to get to a director as well. Um, and not, I'm not saying make them an offer, not make them a pay or play offer. I'm just saying you say to a director, I've got a hundred thousand of my million. Even a director, like a director with some decent credits, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of directors in this town that have credits that are looking for work. And they see you even have some of your money and a good script. It's not as hard as you think. You have to go out and you have to network. Don't be afraid to go on IMDb Pro and hit them up via email because their email's probably, you know, they might have an email on there or whatever. I'm not talking about the biggest of the big guys. I'm talking about guys who've, you know, they've done a half dozen movies, you know. Um, somebody that you might trust if, 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 it's, not, if it's not you. But f find a director that, um, that, you know, that has some credits or that has um, some sort of cachet or, or you know, might, might, uh, might appeal to, to your cast, maybe the genre that they work in or the credits they have. But most casts are going to say, well, okay, who's directing? Or the agent's going to say, who's directing? Um, so first, you, get your, you have your script. Second, you have your seed capital. Third, you have your supporting materials. Then you go after your director. Fifth, is optional, but I, I highly recommend it. You try to get a distributor on board. So many people wait till their movie's done to get a distributor, and I think it's a mistake. And I say this to most of my clients. I say this to most of the people I work with. Get a distributor on board early. So many people are, are afraid that the distributor's going to usurp their creative authority. It's still your project, but it's a business. Again, it's show business. This is my old professor, Peter Guber, used to say, uh, it's not show show. It's show business. It is a business, um, and there's no other industry um, like entertainment where pe people forget that. They, they just look at the art and they forget that it's a business. So like you think about this, what other industry would you spend millions and millions of dollars setting up R&D, 
setting up a warehouse and doing manufacturing and creating widgets. I'm gonna make widgets, wait, lots of widgets. And then at the end you have boxes and boxes of widgets. You go, okay, cool, now I'm gonna figure out how to sell these and where. Nobody, nobody does that. You watch Shark Tank, right? They come in and like, how much does it cost to do this? $2.16, like they have their numbers, they know. Film is the same. It might also be an art, that's true, but it's a business too. And so you need to remember those things. Um, so getting a distributor on board, they can help you with story and script and say, like, this is your ship, that's fine, but you should have these elements. They can help you tailor it. Um, they can help you figure out the cast. The problem with a lot of films is, you'll hear this from distributors, is by the time we get it, like, there's nothing else we can do. Like, we're stuck with what, we can't change the cast, we can't give them any notes on the story or the budget. Go to a distributor early, because they can tell you, hey, if we can get the budget down a little bit, we can get these people, you make these little tweaks to the story, I think we have a good chance of selling this. They can tell you about positioning and marketing and things you should be thinking about early. After all of those things, then it's time to go to the cast. Um, and you think about, and again, I, so let's just use this example of, let's say you've got a $250,000 movie and you've managed to put together 50 grand. With 50 grand, you can hire a decent casting director. Casting director is worth their weight in gold. Worth their weight in gold. They've got the relationships. They know who's on the upswing, who's on the downswing, who's commanding what money. They've got relationships, the agents manage. I mean, they're really, they are worth, they can put together lists of ideas that you never even thought of. Um, and if you can get, you put a little bit of that money toward a casting director, and you've got your distributor on board, the distributor can give you sales estimates based on the names your casting director has put together that you and your casting director have worked. So yeah, your top 10 list, let's say for the top you know, two or three roles, you've got your top 10 wish list that you put together with your casting director. The distributor that you have can say, you know, or sales agent, one or the other, and they can, but they can say, here, here, here's, here's the value they bring and here's you know, the kind of money that we think we can get from them. Um, so you know, if they're, you know if they're viable for your size project. Let's say you spent five grand to get your casting director. You still got forty-five thousand dollars sitting there, right, to make your partial pay or play offers, like I did with Thomas Hayden Church, and it worked with Thomas Hayden Church, and it's worked a couple other times as well. Thomas is the biggest example, but it worked. So it's it's um, to me again, um, if you're trying to get a film off the ground, and, and again, sort of you know with with name actors on, let's say at least a low six-figure budget, screenplay, seed capital, get your supporting materials together, director. Get a distributor, and then you go to your cast. That's, to me, that has been the order that has worked most effectively because one sort of plays off the other, right? I mean, the director wants to see the script, and the distributor wants to, know, you know, the cast wants to know who's directing, and you know, uh, the distributor helps you get to the cast. So, there, there's rhyme and reason to all this, to all this craziness. I'm going to pick up with financing because this was obviously a big question um, a lot of people had. First of all, um, what do financiers look for? And and again, I told you guys, I hate raising money. Hate it. Um, I don't think I'm very good at it, but I just don't like it either. Um, but I do know what financiers look for. Uh, and I, even though I hate it, I, I'm often tangentially involved um, to some degree. When I say I don't raise money, I don't raise suitcases full of equity. Suitcases full of cash. I don't raise, I call these people unicorns. Just people that have millions of dollars and are looking to finance your movie. I call them unicorns. Good luck finding a unicorn. Um, but here's what financiers look for. Three things. Number one, money in. Any good line producer can tell you money in. It's how much do you need to make your film. So you have an idea of sort of the, the range and the world. Um, you know, budgeting is not strictly bottom up. It's not strictly top down. Meaning, top down meaning, oh, I want to do this for two million. But it's not bottom up either where someone, people have handed me a script before and they've said, how much would it cost to make this film? I'm like, I don't know, is Matt Damon in your movie? Because you can add 10 million bucks to it if, if he is. I mean, you know, it, bottom up is building the budget, you know, as a line producer, building the budget. Top down is, you know, is sort of the, 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 the executive producer or the, or the senior producer saying, here's, here's the kind of budget range we want, but you gotta kind of meet in the middle. Um, but money in is how much is it gonna cost to, to make this thing? A good, you know, working with a good line producer, you can figure that out. Number two, money out. So meaning, how, how am I gonna make my money? How much am I gonna make my, you know, how much am I gonna make? Uh, when am I gonna make it? Um, it's the ROI. And how do you show money out to, to, uh, to a, an investor? Um, this is your business plan. This is in that last section we talked about your supporting materials. This is your business plan. So bankable cast. Even if they're not attached yet, at least have wish lists of bankable cast. How do you validate the bankable cast? Remember we talked about having a distributor or sales agent on board to help validate. Um, because they can put together foreign sales estimates, they can help you put together revenue projections based on that cast wish list. Even if you have no one attached, but you can say, look, 
here's our wish list. We want to go, we're going for Kate Beckinsale, Jessica Beale, Jessica Alba, um, you know, whatever, whoever. These are the people on our list, and here's the kind of numbers. If we can get them, here's who our sales what our sales agent says that um, you know we can expect to earn, um, you know, uh, based on their name. So, so sh showing the investor how you're going to get their money back. Um, you have a budget; it's a million bucks. You feel, you know, based on this budget, you can get X, Y, Z actor and your sales uh, uh, agent or your distributor saying, you know, we feel like we can do this kind of business on this kind of movie, on this kind of budget with those actors, and that's you're showing your 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 investor a path to recoupment. Um, so you show that in your a lot, you know, a, there's a lot of things that you can show in your business plan. Just having the distributor in your business plan, the investor knowing, well, the film's going to get distributed at least. You have a distributor. You put a profile on the distributor in the business plan. Um, you know, profile on your team so that they know that, you know, that they're working with, you know, reputable filmmakers that you guys actually know what you're doing. So you have a good profile on yourself and your team. All of these things are, they're important. Having the producer profiles, the director profile, the cast wish list, they show the investor that, well, okay, I've got a viable path to get my money back because I'm working with professionals. And for this budget, this distributor with, thinks that with this cast we can make uh, X amount back. Uh, maybe showing tax credits, how you can leverage the tax credits to help pay them back if you're not using them as part of your budget. Say, well, we're going to shoot in Oklahoma. It's 35% tax credit. Two, and another 2% if we, if we have the music done locally in Oklahoma. You get 37% back just through Oklahoma um, of whatever we spend there. So if you're going to spend a million bu bucks there, there's $370,000. Um, there's also federal tax credit programs. It used to be called 181C, and now it's called something else, but where investors can leverage uh, and, and write off like 100% of their investment is passive income. Um, and there's been some changes to it. I don't know all the details of it. But, but, um, but having those kind of things in your business plan and saying, look, right off the bat, through tax credits and through this, this is show, show them how they're going to get a return. Um, once, once you do that, the third thing, what's really going to differentiate, you've got to think about, you've got to show them the money in, show them the money out. The third thing is why you. Um, is you know, what makes you and your story a better investment than the other 10 business plans sitting there? You can get ten other pictures, ten other budgets, ten other biz, uh, ten other business plans that all are showing money in and money out. But why you? What makes you different? Um, if I'm going to give you a million bucks, um, I got to see may, maybe it's something. Maybe it's the story's really topical. Like, wow, this has to be told right now. Um, you know, I, I'm working with um, with a guy right now. We've got this this really cool. I, like, I'm so excited about this. Um, and he's out putting the money together. I, like I said, I'm not I'm not doing that part, but but um, about this family who g gets this um, smart home device, like a Google Home, like an Amazon Alexa, like one of those kind of things, to help tutor their kids because they're trying to get their kids in this private school and they're having trouble tutoring the kids. And the kids speak in this sort of um, like made up language when they don't want the parents to know what they're saying and the parents hate it. And they bring home this Alexa type thing called a Litu and um, the, um, the kids hate it at first, but then the Litu teaches itself their language and starts to befriend them and all of a sudden like they, you know, they um, they start it ingratiates themselves you know into their lives, and they start doing better. It starts tutoring them, but then it starts this box starts having the kids push boundaries, and it starts to like take over, like telling the parents what to do, and put, like pushing boundaries, and finally the parents are like, okay, enough's enough, and they get rid of it. And then the kids at this point they're like, no, because they love this thing. They secretly get another one, and the kids and the box start plotting to take out the parents. Like, and I'm like, this is such, I read the script, I'm like, this is one of the coolest scripts I've read in a long time. Like the pitch was so good. And a lot of times you read the script, and you're like, oh, it's not as good as the pitch, unfortunately. But this script really was. And I'm like, but we need to make this, it's so topical right now. We can scare the shit out of people with the home, the whole, you know, this smart home thing is so big right now. So that's an example of like, why you? Why? That would separate, if, if I had a pile of 10 business plans and I saw that and it, because it was so topical and relevant, I'd be like, this separate. Think about what might separate you and what might get someone excited. But those are the three things investors look for. Even if they don't know they're looking for them, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the money in, how much you, money in, how much you need, money out, how am I going to get my money back, and how much am I going to get back, and when am I going to get back. That's your business plan. Work with your sales agent. Put, put those numbers together. Cast wish list. Put your profiles together on your team. Show them that they're, you're working, they're working with a, a good team. Uh, and why you? Why is this story got to be done now? What makes you different? And don't just say, I'm passionate. Everybody's going to say that. you got to really find a real angle like the one I just I gave you. I gave you a specific, specific example for that very reason. Finding out something that's sort of, um, that, 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 that's an angle that's going to excite them. And knowing who your financier is, you know, if you know your financier, 
that might help you figure out the angle if you know what they're into. Types of financing, people are asking me like, well, you know, so what types of financing are, are out there? Because most people when they think of financing, they, they think of private equity, they just think about equity. Equity is, is your suitcase full of cash? Um, and you're always going to need at least a little bit of equity. You're, I mean, I, I, I'm hard pressed to find many independent movies that got made without at least some equity. Um, the, and the equity is, the equity investor is, you know, they're, they're the ones that are going to get repaid based on the revenues of the film. What's a standard equity deal? Y usually about 120% return to your investor. So if you guys are offering your investor something, it's usually about 120% first out. So saying, you know, give me a million bucks, you're going to get paid 1.2 back before anybody else gets paid. Assuming that they're the only investor. If there's multiple investors, then you can split it, what they call pro rata pair pursu, which means, you know, if you put in 50%, you put in 50%, you're going to get 50% back, and you're going to get 50% back at the same time. Every dollar comes in, you get 50, and you get 50. It's called pro rata, means equal proportion, pair pursu means at the same time. So 120%, and then anywhere from 30 to 50% thereafter. So. You know, you say, um, after you make your 120%, you're going to get 35% of everything thereafter, and then I'm going to get 65%. Um, that would be a, think of semi-standard private equity deal. Um, but private equity is not the only type of thing. Suitcases full of cash uh, are not the only type of financing. There's debt equity, so that's cash in the form of a loan. I try to stay away from cash in the form of a loan whenever I can, because you have to pay that back, um, unless you know how you're going to pay it back. So if you have like a minimum guarantee or, or a negative pickup deal from a studio, okay, you know, a negative pickup deal is like where the studio says, we'll buy the film once you deliver it as long as you meet the criteria of the contract. Like as long as it's a stand, you know, grade A quality, theatrical quality motion picture with these actors at this budget level and you know, whatever. As long as you meet the criteria, when you deliver the film, they buy it. That contract is bankable. So yeah, maybe you take out a loan on that contract. But as long as you, I, I wouldn't, I kind of stay away from debt equity unless I have something bankable like that. Um, bridge loans, which are short-term loans to help you get from one stage to the next, that would be an example of debt equity. You know, where you just need a short-term cash infusion to help you get to some other stage of financing. Um, but debt equity is another um, uh, type of financing. Tax credits. Um, also, tax credits are either, you know, there's usually some sort of rebate or incentive offered by the state upon completion of the film. Um, but how can you use that to make the film? Well, if you provisionally get accepted for a tax credit, you can take that paperwork typically and bank it. You can go to a, an entertainment bank and they'll lend against it. Not a dollar for dollar, but like maybe 82 cents on the dollar or something. So if the state of Oklahoma, as an example, says for your 370,000, say, yeah, you know, you're going to spend, we think you're going to spend a million bucks here. You're going to get 370,000 bank back. You might be able to go to a bank and get 290,000 or something off of that 300 or whatever whatever that number winds up being, 80 um, percent. Um, foreign pre-sales. Um, you know, that's where you sell the film to uh, to a foreign territory before the film's made. Again, bankable. So if your sales agent, you have, let's say, you have Jessica Alba and Jessica Biel starring in your movie, and you you have your sales agent on board, they can take it to England and they pre-sell the movie at, you know, or whatever. They go to Cannes and they pre-sell it. Um, you can take that contract and you can bank it. You can go to a bank and you get 80, 82 cents on the dollar or whatever. Um, depends on who buys it. I mean, it has to be a legitimate company. But if a legitimate uh, foreign buyer buys it, you can bank that contract. Um, gap financing, not as big now. Uh, it used to be big. Gap financing is where a bank comes in and invests. Usually it's like the last 20%. If you have 80% and you're looking for that last 20, gap financing is a bank coming in and saying, we'll put up the 20. Um, but it has to be against some unsold foreign territories. You have to have some territories that haven't been sold yet. They want to see that you've sold a couple so they know it's viable, but then, you know, that the project's viable. So maybe your sales agent has sold England, but Japan is still available and Australia is still available and Latin America is still available and France is still available. Um, so that needs to be against some um, you know, some unsold foreign territory. The thing about, the thing about GAP is it's, it's really expensive and it gets paid back first. So if you have an equity investor, they have to sit behind the bank. So it's, it's tough. You know? So you might have a guy, he's putting up 800000 a year million, but he doesn't want to sit behind the bank. So the bank says, we'll put up the other 200000 but we get paid back first and at a very high fee. Um, that's GAP financing. So GAP, GAP can be tough. But if your financier is on board with sitting behind the bank, and waiting for the bank, then you know it's um, it's vi it's it's viable. But it's um, you got to have a sales agent. You got to have at least one or two territories sold, and then the rest of the world uh, open for them to to leverage against. 
Um, then there's super gap, which is another type of financing where if you have, let's say, 70% of your financing and the bank comes in with the other 20, now you've got 90, super gap financier will come in with another 10. They'll sit right behind the bank, but in front of your equity investor. So the gap gets paid back first at a high premium. The super gap gets paid back next at a high premium, and then your equity investor. So it's essentially these levels of financing. Um, if you guys wanted to look up specific gap or super gap financiers, you could probably Google it. Super gap financing. I'm sure links will come up to companies that do super gap and gap financing. Um, gaps mostly bank, but there's 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 companies that do super gap. I don't know. Grov, Grov, Grovner Park still does it, but there were there are companies that do super gap. So if you're kind of almost there with your equity, what I'm trying to tell you guys is you don't need to have a suitcase full of money to cover your entire budget. There's other ways to do it. Um, deferments. I try to stay away from deferments. I told Will, the film Will and I did together. I told Will I don't do any deferments. Uh, deferments and back end are two things people often confuse. How many times I've talked to people and they go, oh, well, yeah, no, I might not have to pay them. Their, their pay is deferred. I'm like, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay them. It means you just have to pay, you have to pay them, but later. Deferments are, you know, uh, my editor's going to get paid six months from now instead of right now. But you still, ha in six months, you have to pay him, as opposed to back end, which is people agreeing to, to, to be paid contingent on the film's revenues. That's back end. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get, yeah, I'm gonna get paid back end if the movie makes money. That's not a deferment. Deferment is you're getting paid, but later. But you're gonna get paid. If six months it comes due, it's time to pay the piper. So I, I either I pay you now or you're pay, or you're getting back end. But I don't I don't like to do deferments. I like to either pay people. I have the budget. I'm gonna pay you now, or um, it's or it's straight back end. Um, grants are another way, especially if any of you guys are documentary filmmakers. A lot of grants. What's the difference between grants and equity? Grants, there's no obligation to pay back. You know, in private equity investment, you don't have to pay them back either, but they're, they want their money back. But grants, it's like, here's the money. Um, so like the IDA, the International Documentary Association, Unscripted Film Labs, those are some of the companies where you can find film documentary grants. There's a lot of them. Um, they often come with a lot of rules. <laughs> Um, like you have to have already shot 10 minutes or has to be within this subject matter. We're only taking projects between April and May. But look into grants. Um, and it can often be sort of offset maybe some other financing that you already have. Um, In-kind contributions. So those are donations. Um, you know, In-kind will count if it's a significant enough to, to mean something in your budget. So if you're doing a million dollar film and somebody donates something that's 50 grand, that's 5% of your budget. That's that's worth it. I mean, if it's a budget line item, but it's being donated, it still counts. Same as if it was cash. Um, so in kind is important. Sometimes locations. You get your whole location donated in kind. That's a budget line item. That counts. Um, brand integration and product placement. Um, there's a lot of companies out there like BEN, Brand Entertainment Network. Um, uh, there's another one, Ho Hollywood Branded. There's a lot of these that you can reach out to, especially if you have a little bit going for you. If you already have an actor attached or um, maybe you just have a really solid project that you think, um, I, for Worth the Fight, I reached out to Everlast. I just started talking to Everlast. I have a relationship now with the guy, and he's like, yeah, we could give you a whole bunch of product to put in the movie. I'm like, cool. Yeah, like now I'm talking to the head of brand integration there. Um, product placement, brand integration, a little bit different. Product placement's like, this is just like sort of sitting here. It's like a Coke bottle in the shot. That's product placement. Brand integration is it's being used by the actor. It's integrated into the story. Most of the brands want brand integration. They actually want George Clooney drinking the Coke and talking about it. Castaway, FedEx, that's a good example of brand integration. Um, as opposed to product placement, it's the gratuitous, oh, right in the background, the Coca-Cola sign. Um, all, and sometimes brands will pay money to have their product in your, um, in, your, in your project, depending on the size of the star, the scope, and scale of the project. So just getting back to foreign pre-sales for a second, someone specifically asked me, how do they work? How do foreign pre-sales work? Um, and it's really not that complicated. So you need to get a foreign sales agent. There's a lot of them out there, Hyde Park and um, Arclight, and these are you know, examples of sales agents. There's big ones, there's small ones. Those are some of the big ones. Um, basically, you, know, you take your project to a sales agent. Um, again, I think as early as you possibly can. I'm a big fan of getting distributors and sales agents on board as early as possible. They might not be, if they're really big, they might not be interested unless you have some name actors. But there's a lot of small to medium-sized ones. Um, that I think you probably could get get interest from if you have a you know a solid script. Maybe it's based on a really interesting story or, or something. But but um, uh, you go to a sales agent and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm putting this film together. I've got some seed capital, uh, what have you. 
um, you might be able to get them to, to, to agree to sign on. But they probably won't be able to pre-sell anything unless you have an you have an actor on board. That's what everybody wants. Is you know what are the factors to, to pre-selling? Cast. Number one is cast. Number two is cast. And number three is cast. That's what they cast, cast, cast. That's what they want. Who's in it? Um, then I would say fourth is genre. Um, what's the genre? Oh, so I got Dolph Lundgren. Oh, awesome, great. It's an action movie. Oh no, it's a romantic comedy. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, or you know, vice versa. You know, I've got Julia Roberts. Oh, cool, but it's a martial arts movie. Oh, okay. Like it's the right actor in the right right movie. Genre, and then probably so I'd say actor first, then genre, then budget. The budget for that uh, project, and then maybe director. If if it's a director driven project and the director is big enough, that can have an effect. So you get the sales agent on board. You do a contract with the sales agent. You hire them, um, and in your contract. So uh, the question that this this subscriber asked was like, who does the negotiation for the 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 the, the, uh, the deal? And so basically, we, when you hire a foreign sales agent, you do a contract with them that lays out all the parameters for your arrangement, um, and it will tell you uh, how much leeway they have. So it might say any deal up to X amount, they can just close that deal on their own. They don't have to ask you as the producer. Hey, is it okay if we close this deal with, you know, Australia? For for twenty thousand dollars, they can just do it. So whatever the parameters are, it's going to be in that contract. Um, and then you know, so but with input from the producer, the sales agent goes to the the uh, foreign you know, to the, to the markets to AFM, Cannes, Venice, Berlin, um, and they uh, try to sell your movie based on the package. Um, and that's it. And they come back to you and say, hey, we sold three territories while we're there. And if you want to maybe bank those, you can. But it's it's really that's you know it's really not that complicated. Um, Approach the foreign sales agent with your project, and um, if they like the project, you do a contract with them, and they they go to work. Um, I also got asked a lot about crowdfunding, and I've mentioned this to Karen and Dave before. I'm not a fan of crowdfunding. I really don't like it for films. I, I'm not. It's not that I'm not a fan of crowdfunding. I'm not a fan of crowdfunding films. And for there's three basic reasons that I'm not a fan of crowdfunding. Number one. I feel like it works great for like sort of new innovative products, technology products, things like that, things people can hold and touch. Films are, you know, so many films out there. People are like, oh, that's cool, but you know, like I'll see it when it, you know, it comes out. It's, it's tougher than like this create new innovative thing that people want to be a part of and they're going to get to hold it and touch it. Um, so I feel like if you look at what does well on crowdfunding platforms, it's usually tech stuff and innovative new products, not so much film. And when I say when I say um, not films. Not films from a stranger's perspective. Strangers don't typically look at someone else's film and go, "Yeah, I got to invest in that." But they, but tech products, they do. Two is you know you just wind up hitting this. You wind up hitting up the same friends and family you could have just hit up directly. That's what you wind up doing. Hey, I'm on, I'm on Kickstarter. Give, give, give me you know give me money. You could just hit them up directly. Now you have, you have to spend time, you know, putting together these whatever you promised they would do, taking away all your time from actually. Putting the film together because you have to. Oh, they were level five, and I've got to do this. I've got to give them a copy of the poster and a copy, of, and just I, th I think it's a distraction. And you wind up hitting up the same people you could have gone to directly. And third is you wind up giving away five percent of your budget. So if you raised a hundred grand, and you need that hundred grand to make your movie, you just gave five thousand dollars to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. You could have used to make your movie. You could have gone to those people anyway directly, and you didn't have to give five percent to those platforms. I have not seen a lot of, and there might be some people that watch this video and go, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I raised money on that. Maybe they did. I'm just telling you, for me, I didn't, I don't, I haven't had success with it, and those are the reasons I don't like it. Um, one quick important lesson, I'm going to end the financing session because I want to keep it going, but, but um, is you guys should understand raising money is raising money is raising money. No matter how much money it is, it's hard. It's the same. Raising 250,000, raising two and a half million. A lot, a lot of mistake a lot of filmmakers do is they, they try to cut their budgets way down in hopes of getting attracting an investor easier, and it doesn't work that way. A lot of investors they might look at it and go, 250,000. Well, how am I going to make my money back? I can't make a good movie that way. I'd rather give you a million to make a movie with a, a, a bigger name actor. I actually have a chance to get my money back. Making it for a lower budget does not necessarily mean um, that it's going to be easier to fund. In many ways, sometimes it's harder to fund. But raising money is, it's all relative. There might be more people out there with 250,000 than 25 million. There, that might be true, but it's no easier to get them to part with their money. It's all relative. You still have to convince that person to part with their money, it's tough. So don't think that you need to cut your budget way down to try to, 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 try to get your money. That's not necessarily always um, the best avenue. Um, I want to get a little bit into the produ production stage um, because I got the question, how, to, how, how, how do I produce cost effectively? 
Um, and you know, it's such a broad question because that, that's always going to depend on the needs of um, your production and the size of your budget. Um, but again, like I told you guys, I always try to make dimes look like dollars on screen. So a couple things. You know, number one, hire for talent. Hire for talent. Hire hire people that are better at what you what they do than you are at what they do. Um, and listen to those people. Listen to people who are experts. I've sat with people. I'm like, well, you know, I'll tell people, listen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna give you three things. I'm going to tell you the result I want. I'm going to tell you when I want it. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to give you to get that result. You know, say you're, the you're, the, you're my DP. Here's our budget. Here's the camera I'm going to give you. Here's what I want it to look like. I want you to make sure the director's taken care of, and we need to have this thing shot on schedule, blah, blah, whatever. Okay, great. Go do it. I hired you because you know more about shooting than I know about shooting. That's why I hired you. So hire for talent. Listen to your people. There are a lot of, um, there are a lot of good people in this town. Um, especially in Los Angeles, but I mean, the, the competition um, is 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 stiff. Um, you know, is pe people are trying to you know outgun each other. They're trying to get the jobs. There's a lot of people looking for work, so you can find good talent uh, for a reasonable cost here. Go to Nashville. I shot music videos in Nashville, and they all expect like commercial level rates for indie films. People, you get pay 200 a, a day here, and they want 400 a day there because that's what they're used to. You know, and there's only a few small. You know, there's like. You know, the crew members are, you know, it's like not as many crew. There's so many crews here. But yeah, have 100 productions going on in LA and you always find a crew. You can always find a crew here. So um, hire for talent and pay your people, feed your people. Um, that's, it'll show on screen. And you've heard that before, but it's true. It's one of those truisms. It will show on screen. Feed them well, um, hire for talent, pay them well, listen to them. Um, on films under a million bucks, um, go for the non union crew, but use SAG actors. Always use SAG actors. Always. It, 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 you can cut around some bad art department here or there, or you know, bad shot, or whatever. But like your actors, man, they're always bad acting will kill that film. You, you know, the script and the acting. So one thing I've even even on I've done the lowest budget film I've ever done is about a hundred hundred thousand narrative, and even that I use SAG actors. You can get good SAG actors. SAG ultra low budget scale is one hundred twenty five bucks. And you know you're an actor, right? One hundred twenty five bucks a day. For eight, 125 for eight. So you can get good act. It's worth it. Non-union crew, no problem. There's a lot of good, solid, skilled non-union crew. Um, if you're a million bucks is like sort of that line where the union starts sniffing you out. But if you're under a million bucks, I, you can get away with it. But always a SAG. I always use SAG actors. Um, and then you know, again, again, part of producing cost effectively, just negotiate great deals on on gear locations. You know, vehicles, resources, things like that. Those are kind of below the line things. There's so much competition here. You can there. If somebody doesn't want to give you the rate that you want, you're like, all right, I'll go down the street to the next guy. I mean, there's so many options here. So don't be afraid to negotiate. But but in terms of producing cost effectively, I think that that sort of is. There's no there's no big dark secret. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, making the most of a small crew. Um, you know, make sure your story is contained enough. If you have a small crew, if you don't have a lot of resources. Make sure your story is contained enough to be uh, effectively pulled off in, the, in that time frame, um, and that doesn't mean this is another thing that drives me nuts. It's, it can all be done in a single location, so it doesn't mean it's going to be cheap. I shot a whole movie called New York Christmas in the Biltmore Hotel, and it was an indie film. It still caught, it still was running me twenty five hundred three grand a day just for the hotel rooms because it's the Biltmore, and it had to be this high end hotel, you know. And for an indie film, that was a lot of money. You know, so but we never moved. We the whole thing was in that hotel, but it was one expensive location. So one location does not mean cheaper. Um, it could save you time because you don't have to transport and you don't have to get trucks and stuff like that, depending on on the size of the film. But when I say contained, I just mean you look at the script and you go, "Hey, do the logistics warrant? Can I keep the budget down because these logistics aren't you know kind of crazy?" Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean a single location. Um, and figure out maybe what, here's another way to make the most of a small crew and be effective, is figure out maybe what positions can be combined um, and cut, for example. Now, when I say what positions can be cut, the first thing I'm going to tell you is do not cut your script supervisor. Don't do it. Don't do it. You might say, oh, we can do it without it. No, you can't. And more importantly, your editor can't. Don't cut your script supervisor. You're welcome, script supervisors. Um, but there are some there are some some areas that you can that you can combine. Um, for example, like you know maybe your second AC or your editor can do your DIT, 
um, or if it's just basically data management, not true DIT where they're doing color correction on stuff, but data management. Um, maybe you you know you're. Um, I have a second AD who on smaller films when we're doing like ultra lows or low modified low, he coordinates for me. Like I, if I'm UPMing, we'll sort of share coordinator duties. I don't have to hire a separate coordinator. The second AD steps up and we we kind of do the coordinating. Um, maybe if it's small enough, you have a PA that can do crafty. My wife does craft service. She'd kill me if I said hire a PA to do crafty. But depending on the budget, if it's kind of like, look, here's the shopping list. Just go get this stuff. Um, there's, 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 there's roles that can be combined. That's another way to be um, effective. Interns, can you hire some interns? And when I say hire interns, I mean from a school where they're getting credit um, because you want them to show up. Remember, you get what you pay for. Don't say, well, yeah, I'm going to use my friends for these five roles. Don't do it. Don't do it unless you're paying them. Don't do it unless you're paying them. But interns, they're getting paid with credits. So, um, so I mean true interns. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I've used production designers that have also done the set dressing. You know, they have a prop master and they have some art department assistant, but, but they'll also do the they'll do the design stuff, the art direction, and they'll also do the set dressing. So you can combine roles. Um, and here's the thing too: a lot of people are like, "Well, I don't think I could pay my crew a lot." You know, hiring crew, and you don't have to pay them a lot. LA is competitive. Again, there's lots of talented people that want experience. Uh, you know, if it's low budget enough, maybe pay cash if you can. And people fire the unemployment. Um, I didn't say that, but they do what they got to do. Um, you know, but if you treat everybody well, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take like, um, I don't know, like a set, set decorator, and I'll give him a chance to be an art director, give him a chance to step up. You know what I mean? Or a second AC gets a chance to first, or whatever. And they really and they'll work for the lower budget. Say, look, I'd love to pay you more, but it's, the key gets two hundred a day. You know, the assistant gets one seventy five. Second assistant gets one fifty. That's the rates but I might hire up. So I'll give you a chance to, to prove yourself because I believe in them. I know, hey, you've been a, a prop master for three years. I know, I'm sure, I, I believe you can art direct. I've seen your vision. The director likes you. Let's give it a, let's give it a go. And they're going to work doubly hard for, le for less money. They're going to work doubly hard because they want to prove themselves. Instead of getting that guy, it's like, oh, I've got, I've got this guy on my budget, budget film. He was the production designer on Rocky. That, that could be a problem when he's like, oh, I'm not used to working in this, these conditions. It's sometimes it's better to get that guy who wants to take a step up. They will work twice as hard for you, you know. Um, dealing with talent, um, you know, it, it, listen, trust your director and your casting director to handle anything below a star role. As a producer, because I'm talking to above the line people here, you guys are producers, writers. As a producer, trust your ca your casting director and your director to handle anybody under a star role. I get headshots or people saying, God, you know, I'd love a small role in this. I'm like, I just don't, but I don't deal with the small roles. I make offers to the names, and the director and casting director do the day players and do that. I don't even, you know, when Will and I did, I think I popped in for the casting. I was like, how's it going? But, you know, other than stars, I don't, you know, um, because as a producer, those are the people that are going to help me sell the film. Um, and that's the producer's, that's really the producer's responsibility. Help bring on the casting director to do that small, smaller stuff and get the stars. Um, somebody asked me about dropping talent for someone else. Um, yeah, it happens. Like you have your friend attached, and you yeah, got a chance to get the movie made, but you got to drop your friend out and put Billy Bob Thornton in. What do you do? Uh, hopefully, your friend understands that you know you got to get the movie made. Um, bottom line, nobody's locked until there's a contract. Do you have a contract with your friend? Because if you don't, I mean, like, hey, friend, sorry, but maybe there's maybe there's a consolation prize, maybe some compensation or another smaller role. But people have to understand. You got, what did I say at the beginning? Get the picture made. And your friend should understand that. Um, so I wanted me to mention distribution. Um, again, I've said this a bunch, but get a distributor involved early and often. Again, they can be your best friend. You still own the project. They don't, they're not going to take the project away from you. They're going to give you a lot of valuable advice. Um, you know, Again, on casting and, and the script and budgeting, marketing, and release strategy, all these kind of things that you need to think about as a producer. Um, and I said this, this is a business, and it's a team effort. And distributors can be another part of your team, just like the camera op, just like the sound mixer, just like the editor. Um, let's see, what else we got? Considering your audience and how to reach them. Yeah, I mean, that's, this is sort of, um, sort of basic, but as a producer, you need to know who your audience is. Who are they? Where are they? Um, and how, how will they see the film? Um, and, not, and not just how will they see the film, what will it cost to reach them? So um, you, as a producer, again, just remember, it's not just production money you're dealing with. It's P&A money. Prints and advertising money. So you need five million bucks to get the, the random guy walking down the street here on Vineland, five million minimum to get that guy's attention. Billboards, bus shelters, minimum five. Um, just as a rule of thumb. Um, 
where do you find P&A funds? Distributors. Um, sometimes there's dedicated P&A investors. This is now, I'm kind of moving forward a little bit, assuming you have your movie, you know, money to make your movie. But production funds aren't always all you need. So, so P&A, there's some, some investors that just put up P&A funds, prints and advertising funds. Um, maybe your original investor, if he really believes in the film, goes, wow, you know, I'll put up a little bit more. I'll put up a million bucks for this, but I'll put up another you know, 100,000 bucks or whatever uh, for P&A. Tax credits, could you use the tax credit money for P&A? If that's, you know, if that's not part of your recruitment strategy for your investor, maybe you can use the tax credit money for P&A. Um, and then platforms, think about, you know, in terms of reaching your audience, what platforms is this, you know, would this play on? Yes, there's theaters, everybody wants the theaters, the holy grail is the theaters, right? But there's AVODs, SVOD, TVODs, you know the VODs, right? Video on demand, AVOD is advertising based video on demand, that's like your YouTube, your daily motion. You're trying to watch it and then there's annoying ads pop up and you gotta sit through them and then, right? Um, your SVOD, which is, you know, your Netflix and Amazons where you pay the monthly. TVOD, trans transactional, where you pay each for each project. You know, that's like your iTunes and also Amazon. Um, and uh, then you got you know DVD, Blu-ray, pay TV, premium cable, um, you know standard cable, broadcast TV, mobile. I mean, think about all the places that that your project can play. This should go in your business plan. It's also part of your strategy with your investor. It's like here's where we see it playing. These are all things a producer should be thinking about early on. Um, and your marketing, also things you should be thinking about early on. There's traditional marketing, trailers, TV spots, um, key art. You know your posters. There's your festival strategy. There's your social media. There's publicity. Then publicity breaks down into field publicity and national publicity. Field is local, national is right. It's big. Promotions. Can we tie in promotions, giveaways, products? Um, and there are specific people you can bring on to handle a lot of these things. On the film that Will and I did, um, and it wasn't right. It wasn't a huge film, but we had a social media manager. Right. We had a PR company to do publicity. Not a big film. Low six figures budget was low six figures. But we had a team. I did the traditional um, marketing myself because I have experience with it. I did festivals. But we, we brought on a team. We brought on a social media person. We brought on um, a, a PR person. It, it was, and there's good people out there, again, just like the rest of your crew that want to work. They're not, maybe they'll do it for a flat fee, which I think is what we did. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, we had some sort of, some sort of good deal. Um, so these are all things, my point is, these are all things you should be thinking about early. Too, not when the film is done. A few miscellaneous things I want to, I want to make sure we have time for the Q&A uh, if you guys have questions, but just a few random sort of miscellaneous things people that didn't really fit into the outline but I wanted to try to address. Networking. Um, someone was asking, um, has in-person networking been totally replaced by social media? No, it hasn't. Um, think of the latter, social media as a tool to help with the former. I got on Facebook back at like 09 just, just to, to facilitate sort of meetings with people where I could get face to face with them, but it's not a replacement. You know, it's, it's just another tool in the toolbox. You will always need face to face networking, always. There's something about seeing someone face to face and talking to them. Would this be the same if you guys were at home, you know, listening to it on a podcast, watching it? It's not the same as being in the room, right? Um, somebody asked, I thought this was really funny, real nobodies versus fake somebodies, who breaks in easier? <laughs> I actually had to think about that one for a little bit. Um, and you know, I kinda, my answer was, depends on what area of the business, actually. Um, sort of this like, next-gen video networks, um, I think like YouTube Red and, and Machinima and Maker, and they might be courting these sort of like social media celebs, but I think as a, as a general rule, in my opinion, real talent ultimately gets noticed. So, you know, sort of the real nobodies, they, they say when they say nobody, meaning they're, you know, they're not known yet. If you have real talent, you're going to get, you'll get discovered. I truly believe that if you really have talent. Um, and real talent can be, can, be, can be honed into a skill. You know, you can take talent, you can create a skill from talent. Um, somebody asked about going from YouTube to features. Um, and as I, what I've told, I used to tell my clients, and what I would tell you guys is telling stories is telling stories is telling stories. And YouTube is just a format, it's just a platform. It, it, whether it's five minutes or 105 minutes, telling a story. I've done commercials. Sometimes telling a story in 30 seconds is harder than telling a story in three hours. I mean, a lot of times, in many ways. Um, and there's really no great mystery. I mean, it's the same thing. Even on YouTube, you know, it's like it, you, you have to speak to your audience. You know, have some good material, um, interesting characters, know your audience, give them value. I mean, that's really comes down to it. It's no, there's no big 
um, mystery there. Um, but some people would say, well, but there's differences in mechanics. I'm just producing little YouTube videos. I don't know about the big feature world. Or vice versa. I'm used to features. I don't understand the YouTube world. Surround yourself by a strong team that knows that world. That's, that's what it comes down to. If you're moving from YouTube to features and you're a director, that's fine. Just hire a strong line producer, strong UPM, ADs, DP, editor, production designer. Hire people that know that world. You know, um, you know when, Will, when Will and I were doing uh, the film that we did together, um, his original idea for a DP had never done any features, never shot a feature. And this was Will's first feature. And I was like, you know, the thing is, I, I respect, hey, look, if you, if you love this guy, great, but the problem is, you know, you got two dance partners and neither of you are experienced dancers yet. If one of you should dance, know how to dance first. And so I set him up on a bunch of meetings with, you know, with, and like, it was like the first or second meeting, Ash, you met with Ash, who had shot this movie called Ninja Apocalypse for me before. And Will's like, done. I love Ash. Done. And now, like, you guys are boys. I mean, now it's like, you know, so, um, but surrounding yourself with a team that understands that world. Um, some people asked me to recommend a few resources. <clears throat> I know we had just been talking about UCLA Extension if you don't want to go to school, but you want to, like, get. UCLA is awesome because the, the professors there are working professionals. I am not a fan of academics. I've said this as well. People that spend their entire time in academia, are, to me, are too disconnected. UCLA has working professionals that come teach the classes. So like my marketing professor at UCLA was the head of all of marketing for DreamWorks. Like Steven Spielberg was her boss. All of marketing. She, and she came and taught a class for three hours. Awesome. So these people teach the extension classes too. You don't have to just enroll in the class. You don't have to get admitted to UCLA. It's just a night class or whatever. You can. So that's one thing. Um, IMDb Pro, you should have an IMDb Pro account. Um, Box Office Mojo, the numbers, those are free. So for your business plan, Box Office Mojo, the numbers, IMDb Pro, it's where you can get a lot of good information on what films made for your business plan, what they cost to make, what they made on home entertainment like DVD and streaming. Um, if you're looking to option scripts, Blacklist, uh, Ink Tip, Spec Scout, those are all decent um, sites for finding scripts. Without a box, good for film festivals, if you're looking for film festivals. Um, that's what I used on, on our project when I was doing the festival strategy. All the research I did, without a box. Um, if you're looking for, for work or crew, staff me up. Um, Mandy, I think Mandy has like a paid feature and a non-paid feature. So if you want a good crew, you probably have to do the paid one. Um, Showbiz Labor Guide, that's online. Uh, now, and I think it's free for everybody. It's a little secret for us line producers. I don't tell a lot of people that, but I guess everybody knows. Cat's out of the bag now. Um, I think it's a media distributors. I forget what company it is, but look up Showbiz Labor Guide. You can find rates for all the union crews and things like that. Um, Movie Magic. You've got screenwriting, screenwriting software. You've got the budgeting software. You've got the uh, scheduling software. Final Draft, of course, screenwriting, everyone knows. Point zero slash I think they call it hot budget now. It was point zero when I was, the version I have is still point zero, but I think it's called hot budget now. It's a budgeting software that's Excel based. So you guys don't have to go spend a lot of money on movie magic. It's cool about hot budget slash point zero, whatever it's called now, is um, anybody can open it. So your investor can open it. They don't have to get movie magic. You don't have to make a PDF of it. They can open it. And it gives you an actuals column. So you can track your actual, what you're actually spending versus your estimates. Movie magic doesn't let you put actuals in. Why? Because Entertainment Partners wants you to buy Vista, their accounting software. That's why. So on a really low budget, like hot budget or point zero is a good. It was originally made for the AICP for commercials, commercials and music videos. But I started using it for low budget films. It's like, I don't need movie magic. It's overkill for a $300,000 film. Um, a few books um, that I like, Creative Producing A to Z. It's a good one. Uh, Merle Schreibman, who was a professor of mine at UCLA, one of my mentors at UCLA. Um, he wrote that book, really good book. Producer to producer, step, um, uh, step by step guide uh, to low budget independent film producing is a good one. Um, the independent film producer survival guide, also a good one, a lot of good resources. Um, and then for script, you know, you have screenplay by Sid Field, story by Robert McKee. They're sort of like the givens, like people know about those. And I stand by those. I mean, they're, 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 they're obviously really solid works. And then in terms of a production software, Studio Plus, Studio and then the plus symbol by Cast and Crew, which is the payroll company, is, a really, is really good for like, um, managing production workflow. If you have a big enough budget, you know, it's, you know, if you're really small, it might be overkill. But managing production workflow, um, storage, distribution, collaboration of you know, forms and schedules and things, it lets everybody sort of access in, in real time updates and things. So you're not like, oh, we got to 
to hand out new pages and all this. So Studio Plus. Um, and then, you know, mentorships, um, you guys were asking about earlier. Um, Somebody asked me, you know, uh, do they provide value? And I mean, look, again, that's why I do. That's why I do this. I enjoy it. I enjoy helping people. I enjoy, you know, inspiring people. And if 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 you guys get even any kernel of usable information from this, then I feel like this was worth it for me. Um, so if you're going to find like a one-on-one -on -one mentor, again, I mentor people in the PGA. Um, just make sure that that mentor is is right for you based on your goals, based on what you want to do. Um, and do some research on them. And mentors are available, you know, through the guilds, through universities, film labs, private organizations. You can find there's there's places to find mentors. Um, I, I've been mentored as well. Like I said, at UCLA, I had a mentor at the PGA when I first went in there. Jerry, uh, Joey McFarland, who produced Wolf of Wall Street and a couple other, a um, couple other things. I signed up to be a mentee, and then I started mentoring other people. So, um, you know, but you have some of these like private organizations that have specific mandates, like women in film or diversity or whatever that you know may have mentorships. So I, I'm a fan, and I think um, they're worth looking into. You never know where that relationship that's going to help your film get going will come from. Um, and then the last, the very last point, the state of the industry. Um, somebody asked, I saved this for last on purpose. Um, is the business getting tougher each day? And the answer is, you anyone want to guess what the answer is? My answers are so all over the place. I just want to know if anybody has, has an idea of what I'm going to say. My answer is not necessarily. Not yes or no, it's not necessarily. Some things are definitely easier. Um, you're living in a time where you've got prosumer technology like Final Cut or what's it, Adobe Premiere, whatever the hot, never, Final Cut's not the thing now, now it's Adobe or Avid or whatever, but you've got these red cameras and Aries, like you've got, you gotta understand like when the Coen brothers made Blood Simple, like they didn't have all this stuff. They had like, they had to get the same big movie cameras and 35 millimeter film that like the studios had, right? You have access to this prosumer technology now um, and numerous platforms like YouTube and Vimeo and places to display your work, festivals, so many festivals now. Um, and all of this, the technology and accessibility has lowered costs. So for the indie world, I think in many ways it's much easier. Bigger name stars are doing independent films. So I think for the indie world, I think things have gotten easier. Never easy, but it's gotten easier than it was at the nascent stages of the indie movement, right? The studio system's a bit different. It's a whole different animal. I think that's gotten harder. Because when I started the business, maybe there were seven studios, now there's like five. MGM was sort of a studio. And now Disney just ate up Fox. And there was like five. It's basically like Disney slash Fox is one, Paramount, Universal, Warner Brothers, and um, Sony. And they used to make like 20, 22 films a year now. I think Disney last year made 12. So if less studios making less films and the type of films they're making are very um, focused. So they're making a lot of franchise pictures based on comic books. And there's like this sort of gap. There's no middle class in films anymore, right? It's just sort of like big budget Spider-Man 12. And then there's, right. And then there's like the sort of $20 million film that George Clooney is like slumming in or whatever, but it's awards caliber, right? So, so yeah, but those $50 million, like they're not being made. Why? In the 70s, into the 80s, you had people running studios that loved making movies. You had this renaissance in the 70s. Love Story was the movie that saved Paramount, right? Love Story, Exorcist, Godfather. You had people like Robert Evans running the studio. They were creatives. They were, he was an actor. You know, and into the 80s, and that was like the generation, I, that was the era, my era. And they, you could tell movies were fun. They loved making movies. Now, you know, you have, this is just true, you have CPAs and lawyers, and they're running the, member crunchers are running the studios. That's part of the difference. So I think the studio world has gotten harder. And that's part of the reason I love the indie world, and I like where I am. Um, and that's and that's why I love what I do, and so I followed follow, followed Grandpa's advice and stuck in that world and love what I do, and that's um, and that's all she wrote. So hope, hopefully there was some good information there for you guys. Yeah, and it was a lot too. You're probably like, but I wanted to actually, you know, I wanted to at least give you guys some specifics and not just platitudes like you can do it. Of course, you know you can do it. That's you know that's why you're here. Um, so you guys say, yeah. But you guys have any questions based on anything? Or, yeah. I'm just wondering, are there screenwriting mentors? People that will help you in writing screenplays? Absolutely. So I think, I think t again, with UCLA Extension, yeah. too, you're going to have access to a lot of 
um, that sort of that internal, without having to enroll as a student. I think that's um, probably a good place to start. I don't know if the WGA has a program like that. I'm not as intimately familiar. Um, kind of like, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of McKee classes and things yeah. like that and, and studied, but no, they're not one-on-one -on -one or they're not like hands-on, right. let me see your script, let me see, you know, let me see where you're going with this. Right. And that will give you real valuable input. Right. Or, or say, you're missing the plot totally here, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so have you have you like researched any workshops online that are you know that I, might? I well, I researched. I don't know. I put in everything I can think of yeah. in Google and etc. But I haven't come up with workshops. Yeah, I think they have meetup groups that. that right, get but you're looking for more one-on-one -on -one type. Yeah, experience. well, or you know, somebody that will really uh, get involved, or, or you know, maybe a, a two-on-one or. You know, but somebody that's there with you really helping you. Yeah. I mean, like, so, like, other than um, maybe through the Guild or through, like, UCLA Extension, another thought would be, do you have representation as a writer? I don't. Because that might be another way is if you can as, get a manager or an agent. You know, a lot of times they rep, they're going to rep bigger clients than you. And you might be able to say, God, you know, I'd love to just be able to talk to this person. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times, it, you know, it's a relationship business. You know, so that might be that might be a way that you can, if you can, through a, a contact like that, through a representative, through like an, if you can get an agent or manager, yeah, that that you can um, tap. I had a book agent, but there's nothing to do with film, you know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think maybe try just, you know, see what you could you know look into like literary agents and managers if you haven't done that. Um, and you have some really, if you have some really solid material, especially like if you've won a competition or I guess that's some of the things when I went over like sort of ways to leverage your material, things that might attract a producer also are the same things that might attract an agent. Mm -hmm. But I think that's another way to get to some of their bigger clients is if you're a client, say, God, I, you know, I'd love to just sit and kind of talk to this person a little bit. They might be willing to facilitate a meeting or mm -hmm. at the office or something like that. That's another way. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned getting a distributor or sales agent on early. What do they look for before they'll start to spend their time and energy or attach themselves to your project? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, I already have some relationships with distributors. So when I walk a script and it doesn't have anything, you know, attached, it's a lot easier for me because they, they know me. I think if you have, do you have, a, a, like, do you have produced credits at all? No. Or, okay. So, you know, it's, it, obviously it's tougher if you don't have produced credit. So you, you might want to have a little something going for it, meaning, you know, a, a, if you have like uh, maybe a, a director that has some credits attached or you have maybe one actor that has some credits or something, but enough where they can still put their fingerprint on the, on the script and they can still help you with the rest of the cast. And so without produced credits, you might need an element, some element to get their attention, a director or an actor, um, maybe. Yeah, or maybe not. If they're a small enough distributor and you have a good enough pitch, just like you're pitching a producer, you might be able to pitch them and say, look, I've got this project and it's based on a really cool article that I optioned and I'm putting together the financing myself and I'm looking for a distributor early. Most distributors would love to hear from a producer early. I talk to most distribution executives and they're like, oh, by the time we get the project, there's nothing we can do with it. And then the producer's like, why couldn't you sell more of it? Why can you sell, make more money? Why can you sell more territories? Like, well, we had no say in the cast. We had no say in the budget. We had no say in the story. So I think in, in that case, um, even a smaller distributor, even if you don't wind up using them to distribute the film, they can give you a lot of helpful advice early on. So maybe start with the smaller ones and see if you can get in the door with a really interesting pitch. And if you're not getting much in the way of you know, response, try to get that director you know, with some credits on board first, or get one actor on board. But be open to letting them give you some input on the st story. You know, when, when, when I made the, that movie Ninja Apocalypse, uh, you know, it was, it's funny, because, you know, it's just a, a genre, it's like a Mortal Kombat, whatever. I was hired on to do it. Um, the distributor and the sales agents were already hired. We had a domestic distributor and we had a sales agent before I was even hired by the head head producer, the guy who was financing it. And um, I remember they said, we need a hot girl. We need a fight every seven minutes. Every seven minutes there needs to be a fight. Uh, we need swords. 
Like the, and a lot of people look at this and go, well, I guess it's like soul crushing, right? But I didn't look at it this way. I was like, this is kind of cool because, all right, so we can tell any story we want. We just have to hit these parameters. It was like, kind of like a fun game, like figuring out how to do this. And we decided to do a remake. Do you guys remember that movie, The Warriors? From 1979, mm -hmm. Warriors, come out and play. Oh, yeah, it was like yeah, a classic, yeah. yeah. We did a ninja, post-apocalyptic ninja remake of The Warriors. <laughs> I'm like, this is cool because we have all these different clans and some shoot fireballs. And we had, I think we had 450 effect shots in that movie. That's like a studio level. It took us a year to do all the visual effects on that. It took us a year. Yeah. Um, but we had cool martial artists. Ernie Reyes Jr. who played one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we had uh, Kerry Tagawa who played Shang Tsung in Mortal Kombat. You know, you've seen him. He's like, I will take your soul. You've seen him. He's like in so many movies. Um, and we had like all these cool martial artists and stuff. And, and, but I had to hit all of this. And they, they, the, the sales agent signed off on Kerry. They're like, oh, Kerry will do well in Japan if you can get Kerry. So we got Kerry. Like we they had all these sort of like rules. Um, or like, you know, we got to hit this. Now, could me and the other producer have said, no, screw off, we're not going to do that? Yeah, but, you know, we want to want to have a chance of making some money back. So we figure, how can we creatively work within those parameters to do that? So, yeah, so to answer your question, I say if, if you don't have credits, or you don't have anything to leverage, if you had credits, you would leverage yourself. Sure. That's what I can do. I can walk in and say, well, I've got, you know, all these movies. So they say, they'll listen to me and say, oh, yeah, we want to be involved. If you don't, Find something that's leverageable. Get a director. Oh, yeah, talent attached. That's leverage. Yeah, but yeah, don't just don't cast the whole thing. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, an actor or a director, some something with credits that the distributor goes, oh, this is real, not just another guy off the street. What about like soundtrack people? People that will say, I'll do a song on your movie, and they're known. Yeah, if it was a big artist yeah. or a music-driven film, that might yeah, yeah. I mean, a bit of like a big, big artist. Typically, music is it's yeah is not. In terms of packaging, it's not a big factor unless it's a music-driven film, or unless you know you got Madonna doing a song. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, it's same with like like uh, High Midnight, the one I told you about with the vampires in the Old West. I had Stan Winston Studios, which at the time they're defunct, but was like the they did the Predator, you know, they, they created the Predator and Alien and Terminator, and um, I had them attached and I put them in the packet because. It was an effects-driven film, so Stan Winston was like part of the package. It's like, yeah, you got Vincent D'Onofrio and Mary Lambert directing, and that's cool. But oh wow, you also have Stan Winston Studios. That was valid. So I'd say it was a music-driven film or a really big artist. Yeah, that would that would mean something. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, to have a low budget doesn't mean that it's easier to get investors, right? So what would be the ideal budget to aim at for an indie sci-fi? So that's, I love, I love questions like that. It's like, it's like seeing how long is a piece of string. No, 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 no. no. So, but it'll be like, you know, like, like not too exaggerated. Like it's, nobody will want to invest. It, depend, it depends on the script. It, it really depends on your script. It, ha it comes down to the script, right? So, you know, I might look at a script and go, wow, you know, this, I mean, 10 million minimum to do this. I don't even know how you would do it for less. If someone handed me Avatar, like, I'd be like, yeah, you can't do this. on a, You know what I mean? So it really depends on your script. There is no... Ideal. That's what a line producer, you know, would help you kind of figure out. Is you know, you sort of figure out what world you want to play in. Yeah, but when I'm writing, I'm trying to think on the budget. You know, I'm trying to mm -hmm. think sure. what locations I want to use. I mean, For sure. Stuff like that. Yeah. So, what should I aim at? Being a newbie and. Yeah, I, I think I think just write what you want to write. Don't try to change your story for budgetary purposes when you're writing. When you're writing, just write. Just write the story you want to write. Because the practicalities, the realities will come in later. When I said, you know, people often cut their budgets down, I mean, they'll have a budget in mind. They'll work with the line producer. They'll say, you know, ideally we'll do this for a million bucks, but I don't think I'm getting a million. If we can just do it for 500, I think it'll be easier to raise the money. And that's a fallacy. It's not necessarily easier. So there's no, what I'm saying is, you know, if, there, if, if you have a project that you know it's going to take a certain budget to do co properly, don't think you have to cut that budget down to attract more investors because it's not gonna, it's not gonna, yeah, work. That, it doesn't work that way. Often it backfires in your face. You know, it's just like I think a lot of times when people put, um, they do proof of concepts. I love the proof of concepts. Uh, we're gonna go shoot five minutes of the movie, or we're gonna shoot a short film to sell the feature. And invariably they do it with a super low budget. So when they show it to an investor, investors like, oh, well, is this what it's gonna look like? <laughs> And you're like, well, no, it's going to be better than this. Like, you're just hurting yourself. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. Um, unless you can do it and make it look as good as it's going to look when he finances it or she finances it. it, it the proof, it's do it on paper. Do, do your pitch back deck. Sell, them, sell yourself. Don't worry about sh wasting money actually shooting 
a five minute short or something. Just don't don't bother. Unless you can do it as good as the movie's gonna look. That's my philosophy on that. I've seen that backfire too. Um, do you have another question? Yeah. Has the market for the seller films diminished with video on demand? I, someone told me uh, Lionsgate is not, you know, spending, you know, seven, eight, nine million dollars buying films out on the market for distribution. Is that true? I think the, the economics are definitely changing. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say what Lionsgate is actually spending or not spending. I don't know. But I can tell you that. The, 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 the shift away from DVD and the shift to streaming and because it is DVD is almost like a non-existent in, you know nowadays um, has definitely changed the economics and and how much like you know like HBO used to actually buy movies and they don't really um, there's one movie they bought last year called the tale I actually have a relationship with that company it's like the only movie they bought last year so so it's the economics are changing in terms of how much companies are spending on I, I'm not sure um, I think that's another good reason to have a distributor and a sales agent because they know, they're there day to day, they know what lines, they know what the buyers are looking for. It, it literally changes, not even month, like week to week it seems like it's changing. Um, you know, I remember going to, I worked on a movie called Harsh Times with Christian Bale and we sold that at Toronto in like 2005. Um, Dave Ayer directed that. You know, Dave Ayer did Fury and Suicide Squad. He wrote Training Day. Um, and I, I remember like a sales agent. He had not done Batman yet. Uh, Christian Bale hadn't. He had, he had signed on to do it. And maybe he was going to shoot it, but he hadn't done it yet. And I remember a sales agent telling me, Christian Bale doesn't mean anything. At the time. I'm like, what do you mean Christian? He's Batman. They're like, yeah, not yet though. I'm like, yeah, but he's, but he's Batman. And they're like, yeah, but it takes two years to... to to germinate in foreign territories. He's not big enough of a star. He's, he's the kid from Empire of the Sun, and he's American Psycho. That's it. That's all they know him from. Like, but who means something? Well, Christian Slater means something. Christian Slater hasn't done a movie in 15 years. No, nope, he still means something. Ray Liotta still means something. Val Kilmer, something. Like, the things, it blows my mind talking to sales agents. I have no, I'm like, wow. That's another great reason to have a sales agent. They know because they're at the markets. They're on the phone with buyers every day. They're going to be your best friend. They can answer more specifically than I can those kind of questions. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Nichols Fellowship competition. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my scripts landed at top 10% of all the submissions. Good. I got a letter. Is that yes. a, something that means to the producer? I think or that or does. Number? I think that does. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it might not mean as much as if you were a finalist or semi finalist, but I think you can get through doors with that. I think if you put a query letter together, and I, again, I, I mentioned the Funds for Writers article that I wrote on uh, screenplay competitions. I also wrote one on how to write a query letter. So you can go to Funds for Writers and check out that, um, that website and see the articles. Um, query letter, simple. Start with the log line. Like here, you know, dear so-and-so producer, here's my, please find attachment, you know, whatever, you know, my, please find below my pitch for whatever, and just a log line. And then a paragraph, a quick paragraph about yourself and that kind of, you know, anything you can leverage. And saying you're a top 10%, you know, finisher in nickels is something worth mentioning, for sure, in that query letter. I mentioned that in the article, so check that out. But yeah, that's, I think that's, that's valid, for sure. You're sure. kind of ignorant, but is, can you explain what nickels is? Nichols, Nichols Fellowship is a screenplay competition. It's prob probably the best, most well-renowned screenplay competition, I would say, probably in the world. Um, it's the biggest, like in terms of um, cachet. They have a lot of, um, a lot of like studio execs and big name producers judge and read those scripts. Mm -hmm. If you finish as a semi finalist, you're going to get phone calls. If you finish as a finalist, you're going to take meetings. You'll be taking meetings. Now, it's tough to get to that level. The thing with screenplay competitions, you have to remember, is they are not looking for stuff that's going to get made. They're looking for stuff that's different. That's a big difference. Screenplay companies, like scripts that you write, like, yeah, this is marketable. This is really well written. It's marketable. It's just like Lethal Weapon or whatever. That's not what they want. They want scripts that are probably never get made, but they're fresh and different and unique. They want scripts that are calling cards. So they're looking for the, really the talent, the writing talent. Right. More than we're going to make this more movie. Than, correct. Correct. 
And that's most of the big screen fight competitions are like that. They're looking for different, they're looking for unique voices, but not necessarily scripts that, that are marketable, if that makes sense. All in the article, by the way, I mentioned. Um, funds for writers, yeah. There's a few good articles on there. That's, again, that's another way I try to get you know, information out or help people is you know, I write articles for, and I think, but I think some of, the good, some of my best ones are on funds for writers. So. But it's a, just a lot of the stuff we're talking about is on there so you can get some details. And I try to put specific links, like here's the ones I like the best, here's why. Um, and I actually lay out, here's the steps to writing a good query letter, here's the things that should be in the query letter. So if you want to leverage that competition win, you know, here's, here's exactly four or five, beat, beat by beat, here's the structure of your query letter. Because I don't want to read a query letter that's more than one page long. I don't want to get through your life story to get to the point. You know, and, but I put specifics in there. Do the log line, here's what should be in your log line. Protagonist, what's his goal, who's the antagonist, what's the conflict, like I lay it out for you. So, you know, this is what I think most producers, you know, again, you know, I learned from you know, Bobby Newmeyer. I worked for a literary agent. I worked for a post company, I worked for a marketing company. I have the indie, sort of indie background, but I also have the studio background, I also have the academic background where I learned from other producers that would have taken me years to get to, like Terry Press from DreamWorks. I would have had to work at DreamWorks for 15 years before I got an audience with her. Instead, I went to UCLA and I got an audience with her. So you're getting the benefit of all of these sort of mentors that I've had that have passed this. So it's not just me saying this, this is the experience I had working for people like Bobby or going to school at UCLA or whatever. Yeah, you, you yeah. kind of touched on it there a little bit, but as somebody who's new to producing, what could be the first uh, two, three steps I can take to propel myself forward? Is it uh, getting experience with somebody else who has, in fact, produced? Obviously, jumping into festivals or something along those lines, giving myself some practical experience, but from, from where you're at, what would you yeah, say? Yeah, if you're going to um, you know, join, join with another producer, you're going to have to bring something to the table, right? They're going to say, okay, like, so what, you know, what do you bring to the table? I always look out as a producer what I'm going to bring to the table if I'm going to come on board a project. Um, but if you're just starting out, I mean, the first, I'd say the, the first thing you should do, the easiest way to get in is find good material. Find a good script or option a good article. That's value that you can bring, even if you don't have relationships with actors or with you know, big name directors or something. Is you, you can find a good script. You can go on Blacklist or Spec Scout or Inktip or network, just, or just network. Mm -hmm. But you know, finding good material, having an eye for good material, I think as, as start, starting out, sure. to be a good producer, you need to find good material. That's where it starts. Starts with the story, and then you know you might be able to attract other bigger producers that you can then start working with and learning from. But you got to bring something to the table. You know, they're gonna say, you know, well, I could do this myself. You know, you see these proliferation of producer credits, right? Like on movies, there's 18 producers. Right. You know, it's like, well, what are they all doing? I hate that because as a producer, I'm, I'm used to being hands-on doing the work and I got 17 other people taking credit for my work. They don't want the costume designer credit, they want my credit. You know, they come on like, hey look man, I'll uh, introduce you to this actor friend of mine, but I want a producer credit. They don't, they don't ask for like the craft service credit, they ask for the producer credit. Um, so you know, think about what value um, that you can bring. So if you're just starting off, I think the, the easiest way to, to start getting involved and getting out there, this is how I, is I found scripts. Found good scripts. Like I, I told you about the prom date script. And that actually wound up getting made too. I didn't make it, but I managed those guys, I developed it, and then they sold it. I think it's gonna be coming out. I think they changed it to Josh Taylor's prom date or something it's called now. But it's, yeah, it's, it's gonna come out. Find good material. That's how I would advise you start. Cool. Did uh, walking in by Palmetto? Oh, walking on Palmetto? Yeah, do you want to tell them that story? Just this interesting story about the Oh, the, the actual story of this, the guy? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, that's actually a, a, a big project that I'm working on. The budget of that's $30 million. It's funny you mentioned that. I was actually earlier today working on the budget for that because all the new union rates finally came out last month. Um, so I was updating the budget on that. And I was, par I was in Australia for vacation, but I was also looking at some possible locations uh, while I was there, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, I was like, oh, wow, this would be great because you could shoot like, dude, Australia's got, you could shoot California there, you could shoot the Caribbean there. Um, and Palmetto's, Palmetto's based on a true story um, about this guy, Miles Richards. Um, we have his life rights. And he was like, he was a huge marijuana smuggler, but what made him, it's very topical right now with all the debate about marijuana and legalization and stuff. It's not what the movie's about, but it is sort of topical, right? Um, this guy never smuggled the same way twice. He was so creative with how he smuggled. 
And he could have been smuggling diamonds. He could have been smuggling donuts. It didn't matter. It's not even about marijuana. It's, as much as Wolf of Wall Street's about stocks, which it's not, right? That, this isn't really about, it's about this guy um, and this life transformation he goes through and like sort of, you know, he, gets, he finally gets caught. But it took him 20 years to catch this guy because he was so creative with how he did it. Like he, he actually, he, he, he um, intentionally, I think, he like intentionally sunk a ship off the coast of Florida with all the weed in these airtight, watertight bags and then filed a um, salvage permit with the Coast Guard. And so every day they got to know him. He's out there bringing parts of the boat up you know, for months, and he has the weed in the parts of the boat, and he's right under the Coast Guard's nose because he's a salvage operator. He did all these crazy creative things, right? Some of these stories are in the, in, the, in the script, yeah. It's really fascinating, this guy's life. And he finally, after 20 years, he got caught. He spent 11 years in prison at Lompoc. I think four were in solitary confinement. He wouldn't rat on any of his friends. But he, when he finally got out, um, he, he went, you know, like legit, started a construction business, made millions of dollars, like, legally. But this guy had such a fascinating life. It's like one of those Henry Hill from Goodfellas or... Um, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale. It's one of those larger than life stories where the, the story, it's a very, you know, it's a big movie with a lot of locations and it takes place over 20 years of this guy's life, but so fascinating. Um, and, and myself and the, and the writer producing with Ed Asner, you know, Ed Asner, he's been around for a long time. So Ed's a producer on this. Um, we just got Clint Eastwood to read it, which was amazing. Because Ed could just call Clint and say, hey, will you read this? And Clint's like, oh, okay. Um, but Clint just did a movie called The Mule. And which is very like this older guy smuggling drugs. Even though it's not what our movie's about, it's just too similar. Um, but just then we said to Clint, "Well, who do you see directing and or starring in this?" And just getting Clint Eastwood to say, "I'm just making something up." But say Clint says, "We're going. We're trying to get this answer." But if Clint says, "Oh, Ryan, Ryan Gosling," it makes it that helps when Ed or I call Ryan Gosling's agent. And go. So Clint Eastwood just read the script and thinks Ryan Gosling should play this. If Clint Eastwood says that. They might actually say, "Okay, we'll take a look at it," but it's a it's a very cool project. We'll see if I can get off the ground. It's a it's very big, much bigger than anything I've ever done. So, uh, and I've been working on it for a couple of years, developing and packaging and stuff. So, yeah. we'll see. Why do you Why do you want me to bring that up? Is there a reason? It's a, cool it's a cool It's a cool story. It is. It is a cool story. Do it not as a criminal. Just do it as legit. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we've made jokes about this. Uh, Miles has said uh, to Jim and I, he's like, I could just do one more load and finance the movie, man, and we'll just say, like, all. I'm like, no, Miles, no, no more load. He's like, I'm just kidding, man, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do one more load, man, and we'll get the. Yeah. He's like, they'll all be at the premiere, and we'll be off the coast of Portugal, man, and it'll be awesome. I'm like, no, listen, no. Yeah. Honestly, this guy's. <laughs> yeah, that's what he wants. That's what he wants. He's like, we'll be doing a load, man. I'm like, no, Miles, we won't. <laughs> yeah, there's no we here. Uh, but yeah, no, that, and that's, but that's the kind of larger than life characters. You know, you find a character like that, find a story like that, and you're going to attract other producers and other interested, you know, interested people. So, yeah. Well, I hope, again, I hope this was beneficial for you guys, man. You know, and, yeah, cool, cool. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it.